taker needs to start taking notes. Yeah, who would the note taker be? Let's see. Roger. Okay. All right, all right. Um, I don't see Roger yet. No, I don't, I don't either. Um, but I tell you what, uh, certainly in the beginning, it's the beginning. So, um, and, and I, I'll have some notes as well. So let me uh, get some stuff out here. Um, oh, that was your little work. Good. Um, all right, let's see here. Just do one quick thing here. Hold on. Okay. So anyway, let me uh, let me go. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Oop, wait a sec. Where's the picture go? There it goes. All right, Calvin. Let me know when you're uh, ready to uh, record. And Mary Pauline, I see you there. Okay. Hey, okay, Calvin, ready? Yeah, we're ready. We're ready. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, meeting is uh, opened here at 7:38. Good evening, fellow commissioners and the general public. My name is Michael Champness, and I'm the chair of the Transportation Advisory Commission. Before we begin, please note that this meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to the county website and on YouTube. To conduct this meeting wholly electronically and to effectuate both the emergency procedures authorized by new state legislation and FOIA. The Transportation Advisory Commission needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record. It's a bit cumbersome, so I ask you in advance for your patience. First, because each member of this commission is participating in this meeting from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and at an appropriate volume for all of the other members. I ask that each of you pay close attention to ensure that you can hear each of your colleagues. I'm asking each commission member participating in this meeting to state your name and the location of which you're participating when I mention your name. Um, the first person on the list, of course, is Commissioner Sperling. Um, and I'm going to divert off the script for just a moment. Um, as many of you know, if you're able to just saw the note Calvin had sent out, unfortunately, Linda lost her father uh, on March 30th, a uh, gentleman named Ed uh, Dickerhoff, uh, his longtime uh, federal employee, uh, a man of uh, uh, great accomplishment, and a man whose daughter loved her very much, loved him very much. Um, our condolences, please, to Commissioner Sperling and her family on, on the loss. Obviously, she will not be here with us this evening. We look forward to having her join us at the next meeting. Uh, back to the script. Um, Braddock District, Kevin Morse. Uh, present from Burke, Virginia. Okay. Jamesville District, Mike Champis. I'm here in McLean. Hunter Mill, Kelly Westenhoff. I am here in Robust Reston. Okay, <laughs> Robust Reston. Um, Mason Hi, District, Roger Hoskin. That's good. We have to do that every month. Um, Mason District, Roger Hoskin. Okay. Mount Vernon District, uh, Pete Sitnik. Pete, I know you're here. <laughs> Let's see, he dropped off. No, he's there, but he's. I think he's maybe muted. He's there. He is. Yeah. I've I failed to push the button. Uh, okay, and where uh, where are you calling from, Pete? Uh, Mount Vernon District. Okay, Lee District, Alexis Glenn. Good evening, I'm here from Alexandria. Okay, thank you. you hear me? Providence District, Jeremy Hancock. Oh, sorry. Yep, Providence Jeremy, District, Jeremy Hancock. Jeremy and Falls Church. Falls Church. Springfield District, Eric Thiel. Yeah, I I a second for the button to react. Um, I'm here in Springfield District, Fairfax Station. Okay. Um, all right, Sully District, uh, M. Davis Giles. Okay. And Fairfax Area Disability Services Board and our uh, August Vice Chair, Mary Pauline Jones. I am here from the wonderful town of Herndon. Herndon, all right. Okay, at this point, I will pass the virtual gavel to Vice Chair Jones so that I might be heard to make the requisite motions. Except the... Sorry, I had, an, I had an issue unmuting again. <laughs> okay. um, thank you, Hey, Except the virtual gavel, I now recognize Commissioner Chan. 
Thank you. I move that we have determined that each member's voice can be adequately heard by each other member of the commission. It is so moved. You have heard the motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, I think that was Mr. Westenhoff. Yes. Um, is there discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Any abstentions? Mr. Chairman, the motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. I next move to the state of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for this commission to physically assemble and unsafe for the public to physically attend any such meeting. I further move that this commission may conduct this meeting electronically through a dedicated audio conferencing line and that the public may access this meeting by WebEx online platform or by calling 1-415-655-001-0001 or 1-844-621-3956, toll free, and entering the access code 129-295-4185. The phone number for ADA is 711. Access information is also available at the tech website at fairfaxcounty.gov. It is so moved. Second. Is there a second? Uh, <laughs> second, sorry, I jumped in. Oh, quite okay. <laughs> okay. Um, is there discussion, it's discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Any abstention? Mr. Chairman, the motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Finally, I move that the- Has joined the meeting. Uh, finally, I move that all of the matters on the agenda previously furnished and posted on the TAC website are necessary for continuity in Fairfax County government and or are statutorily required or necessary to continue operation and the discharge of the commission's lawful purposes duties and responsibilities. You have heard the motion, is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Is there discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Any abstention? Mr. Chairman, the motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. I now pass the virtual gavel back. That's there. right. That's right. Um, we will now start the tax business per the approved agenda. And it is now 744. First item. Uh, actually, I do, Mr. Chairman, have one. Did we not have someone join us while we were yes. going through that last process? I'm not sure if it was one of our members that we were missing or not. I see uh, uh, Jeff has joined us, Jeff Herman has joined us, Mike Garcia has joined us, Mike Riddell, uh, Brent Riddle was, was here all the time. Um, I, I joined on the phone, this is Alexis, because um, my audio was on the computer was not working. Okay, okay. Um, all right, I don't see any other commissioners. I, I tell you, they were uh, uh, Roger Hoskin or David Scott. Okay, all right. Um, thank you very much, Pauline, appreciate it very much. Um, the first item on the agenda here is the acceptance of the previous meeting minutes. Um, and uh, I have to give uh, the Marie Kondo Award for the uh, sparest minutes of all to uh, uh, Commissioner Westenhoff. Um, very good, not much there. <laughs> so it shouldn't take too long to review. Uh, we one, like that. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, exactly. Um, is there not but, enough? Well, it's nice to add a little bit more, but. You know, uh, um, you know, and uh, but at the same time too, we we res respect the time of the commissioners and appreciate anybody doing whatever they can to put the uh, the meeting minutes together. Well, that that wasn't what the issue was for me. Um, minutes mm -hmm. are largely to record action items and not details of discussions. Mm -hmm. And every other board that I've been on that that we did that, but um, I can certainly flesh things out if you. Think that they're too spare. Perhaps that Which might be cool. something since we do adjust every week who takes the minutes, um, not to take up time during the meeting, but maybe a quick guideline then, um, because I would actually have done similar to what Kelly did as well. Um, so that might be something worthwhile if we're looking for uh, more guidelines as opposed to everyone having their interpretation of that. Um, and I apologize, this was Mary Pauline. That's okay. That's okay. Yes. Please. What's the phrase, uh, Mr. Chairman? Brevity is the soul of wit, or something like that. Something like that, or uh, brevity is next to godliness, or something. Yeah. Um, so, 
I am I am not adverse to shorter uh, shorter meeting minutes. In fact, uh, um, this is probably not a bad conversation to have because it is a, a burden that we each have to to, to, to bear. Um, there is a recording of the uh, uh, of the the proceedings, uh, particularly as we meet uh, as a group like this. I'm not sure if it'll if it'll uh, stay afterwards, but I think there's a chance it could because one of the things we've talked about is is trying to have a, a wider uh, you know, attendance by having a mix, perhaps, of inside and and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, remote. Not sure how that would work. Um, but ultimately, um, yes, uh, if we want to just capture actions uh, and perhaps key statements or something, can leave that up to the uh, the person doing the minutes. Uh, certainly, no objection to uh, uh, to doing that. But just remember, my background is also as a lawyer, and the less said, the less Pardon you have to fix. Roger, can you please mute yourself? Yeah. Thanks, I'm here. I have very difficult technical problems. Understand. Thanks, Roger. Um, sorry, Kelly, you were saying? My background is as a lawyer, and I have learned for many years in the law that the least said, the less you have to fix. Uh, good point. So, so yeah. recording actions, motions, and maybe the topic or point of a discussion. Uh -huh. Kind of fits with it, but anyway, we don't need to waste any more time on this. I just wanted to yeah. explain my brevity. <laughs> as an, as this is Eric. As an engineer, I have to add in that that uh, excessive brevity is also how you hit the backside of Mars with your spacecraft rather than going into orbit. <laughs> wow. Okay. Hey, can I, I just add that if if anybody uh, you know thinks that the minutes were to or, or a statement was missed. You know, there's a process for amending the minutes and adding that in. So, including right now, if somebody wanted to add something to uh, 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 Kelly's notes, the one actually the one change I, I would need to make is they're attributed to Alexis. Um, Kelly, your name should be on the top. Other than that, I'm fine. <laughs> I would just say the um, the only other issue that we should consider is I assume at some point we'll be back in person, and these may not be on YouTube, and so the only Kind of public documents of our meeting, maybe the minutes, and so we should just consider whether that's something that we need to address now, or whether we want to expand minutes, you know, in the future. Good point, of course. Um, and uh, uh, I it's a conversation we've sort of, sort of meant to have. Um, I don't want to get into it too long because we've already actually got a fairly long agenda this evening, but it is something we need to resolve. Um, you know, this is, you know, Jeremy, you're right. You know, this is the, the documentation. Uh, this is the record, uh, our bylaws, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, do also uh, specify, uh, uh, some contents for the minutes, nothing too much, you know, motions and things like that. Um, at least the things that, you know, the Kelly has mentioned. Um, I'll admit, I'd like to, uh, have a little bit of the discussion. I don't want to, uh, you know, try and do a, a transcript. Um, you know, or a, a you know word for word sort of thing, but certainly uh, um, important parts of the, uh, the discussion are helpful. Like, for instance, when there's a, uh, a briefing slides, I'll just refer to the slides. You know, and here's the conversation. Maybe there's two or three points in there, each of which takes you know more time. Um, and so, um, yes, let's let's move on from this. Um, but at some point, we'll need to come up with something that we can agree to do each, each time. Um, and the hardest part is. Each of us are having it well, except for me, but then I get to do extra st other stuff. <laughs> um, you know, writing up the minutes, and I know that's a uh, um, it's a burden. Unfortunately, it's not something we can get county staff to uh, to help us with. We're stuck with this one on our own. Okay. Um, well, Mike, I guess I'm still taking minutes tonight, like we normally do. What do you mean? I'm just going to take the minutes and write them up and send them. We haven't made any changes in the 15 minutes I, I wasn't here. Yes, nothing has changed in the 15 okay. minutes that you were. Yes. Uh, but uh, okay. Um, well, I tell you what, uh, we've been discussing the minutes. Um, there's one uh, change that I think we need to make that I've talked about. Um, uh, I guess unless there's any other discussion, I'm happy to uh, uh, accept a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Who, who's on Pete? That's Pete. Roger. And that was seconded. Okay. 
Okay, there's a motion on the floor seconded to approve the minutes uh, as modified, discussed, to change the execution. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Uh, the motion carries unanimously. So they are uh, adopted. Mike, are we still, um, do we still need to approve the, uh, February? Did we? Uh, one one month that we deferred. I think every... the month we deferred was November, actually. Um, because I know we deferred November, and that's the one that uh, David has not done. We uh, deferred February last month. Do we do? Okay. Not I apologize so. for forgetting it now. So let me check my notes here. Okay. Um, um, okay. Um, I think. Calvin, if I'm not mistaken, uh, were you going to make some adjustments on the, the February meeting minutes or uh, a different one? I think I um, I provided some. I think maybe it was just a minor edit to it, but that was prior to the February meeting. So. Okay. Um, I think the issue with the February is that we just got it. There wasn't enough time to review it. Yeah. Um, that and that I wasn't on it. And I think David was, even though he wasn't there. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's right. Thank you for your, for your mind. Um, all right. Well, we don't have the February minutes right now. Uh, let's make a note here um, <laughs> in the minutes that we need to approve the uh, uh, February uh, uh, minutes next next month. And I will, uh, uh, Calvin, please try to remind me that I will uh, make a note here for next month to go through the February meeting minutes. And quite honestly, we also need to uh, uh, also uh, talk to David or figure out something to do with the November minutes as well. So um, I'll take an uh, Calvin, I'll take an action there on the uh, to get the February meeting minutes. In fact, what we can do is we can do those at the other uh, work session. If anybody who's looked at the agenda sees what to talk about here in the work session of the active Fairfax plan. So we can take a few minutes on the May report to take care of that, I think. Uh, okay. Um, with that, um, unless there's any other uh, uh, discussion of minutes, <laughs> um, important discussion, but uh, a little un unanticipated, but that's okay. Uh, I'd like to move into the, uh, uh, the, the first agenda of the evening, um, and that is the, the comprehensive plan. Um, you know, back during the offsite on February 27th, uh, Tom Pizzani had specifically brought up the plan and talked about the, uh, uh, the value of having it as a, a sort of a guidebook for uh, uh, what the uh, commission is, is looking at, things we can do to help put us in uh, a larger context of some of the important planning activities taking place uh, with, the, uh, with the county. Uh, we're not able to do it last month because the, uh, uh, the plan was still still in work and uh, it's still, still evolving, but we'll find out exactly today from uh, Mike and, uh, and Jeff during the conversation here. Um, but I will also say that, uh, um, and I want to thank them in advance for this. Um, they took the time to to look at our uh, uh, the offsite, who the things we're talking about, um, and 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 tried to craft some uh, some topics here that they thought would appeal to us. And, and uh, with the cover, with the stuff I've seen, the conversation I had with Jeff, I think they've done done a good job of doing that. Um, one of the areas I think we'll end up with is complete streets a little bit. Can't talk about it too long, but I think it's a, it's a very good a good segue there. So, uh, what I'd like to do then is uh, turn it over to Mike, I think. Uh, Jeff, is that the idea for Mike to give the uh, the presentation here? Um, That's correct. That's plan. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mike, Jeff, welcome. And uh, uh, feel free to introduce yourself, say hello, and then look forward to getting started. Thank you. Sure. I just want to make sure everyone can see that presentation. Mm -hmm. All yes. right. And so, I'm Mike Garcia. I'm the chief of the transportation planning section within FCDOT. And I'm Jeff Herman. I'm the division chief for said analysis and transportation planning in FCDOT. Okay, so what I'll try to do is I'm going to walk you briefly. I'm just going to put this framework up for you. So, so the agenda is going to talk about the framework and the overview. We're going to get into the transportation policy objectives. I'm going to try to briefly touch on the 13 objectives in the transportation uh, framework, or the transportation policy section. Again, we, we did a crosswalk with the TAC topic areas to try to show how the objectives could kind of fall into the TAC topic areas. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I'll kind of leave that with you all so that you all can kind of peruse that as you see fit. And then we'll also talk about the next steps for the policy plan. And so I'm going to 
gonna try to do all this and kind of being respectful of your agenda and try to finish our my, my presentation in the Q&A by 8.30. So with that, I'll try to walk through this quickly. So the comprehensive plan is, uh, again, it's the legal basis for a comp plan as is established in the law of the Commonwealth. It's in the Code of Virginia, Section 15.2-2223, just for y'all's reference. Um, the local commission shall prepare and recommend a comprehensive plan for the physical development of the territory within its jurisdiction. So I just wanted you all to have that definition so that you can understand why we actually do a comprehensive plan. It's actually necessitated by state, by Commonwealth law. And in our comprehensive plan, we obviously, we have it broken up into, into different uh, areas. So we have the policy plan, which is our, which has the functional areas, and we have 11 functional areas, and you can kind of prove this as you see fit, but one of the functional areas is transportation within the plan itself we have four areas and within those four areas there are the planning districts and you can see the planning districts off to the right of the screen there um, but i i wanted to choose a graphic that showed all the planning districts but they're grouped within the four transportation areas and in addition to that we have we have supportive maps so we have three transportation plan three transportation maps the transportation plan the trails plan and the bicycle master plan and there's also a fourth map which is a land use planning map as well um, so that's kind of how the comprehensive plan is roughly set up. So taking the first component on it only is what we're kind of gathered to talk about today is the policy plan. So the policy plan is overarching again over those functional areas. It has goals, about 20 goals, and within the goals, um, those are set up. And then within those goals, they kind of fall into the actual functional areas and they're kind of they're talked about there so within the functional areas they develop objectives and then within those objectives there are the policies and then if they need to there's specific guidelines so where i'm going to focus today are on the objectives and the a little bit and talking about the policies as they relate to the overall transportation goal let me do this okay so here's a transportation goal again i'm not going to read this to you because that would not be very fair um, so what i'm going to do is kind of talk to you about the major bullets so we have obviously the first one is land use and transportation must be in balance so obviously that's kind of showing that we kind of need to have those things um, in tandem there's transportation and land use are always linked uh, and forever and shall always be apparently um, then we talk about the program and, and how it will be implemented and this kind of leads to the credibility that we establish a program that is planned and will be implemented um, so unfortunately flying car are not something that we should probably plan for at this time um, as much as we'd like to. Then we talk about the accessible transportation through advanced planning and technology. And this is to ensure that we have actively thought about the users and their needs, taking into account current and emerging technologies. Um, through advanced planning, we can try to minimize the environmental and community disruption to so streams and RPAs and thinking creative to solutions to avoid those established communities. We talked about, about the balanced transportation system between modes. And I think this part is critical because this is now something that we need to talk, think about in terms of one Fairfax and equity. We need to make sure that we're actually putting in the transportation systems that kind of are, are appropriate for a particular area. So if an area is kind of low, is, um, low income, then we want to make sure that we're providing a transportation system that can kind of support them and we, or we don't put in such a high quality transportation system that we force them out and then they're no longer able to live in the area. So those are some things we kind of need to keep in mind. Again, the reduction of the excessive reliance on automobiles, especially we target the single occupancy uh, vehicles. So that's that's kind of a big target of what we talk about. Our transportation demand management also kind of targets the single occupancy vehicles as well. And the goal also talks about sidewalks and trails. And this is important, obviously more than ever, and it should always have been up there in importance, but it's a big component of the transportation system and it's not just seen as recreational. So getting getting into the transportation objectives, so there are 13 in here. So one thing I want to highlight for you is that balance is key in these transportation. We have to, there are policies within the objectives that can sometimes counter that that don't drive with each other. So we need to kind of use not only the board policies that they set up, but also the community context, just our overall professional judgment and kind of making sure that we balance the policies and advocate for the ones that we need to advocate for and downplay the ones that don't. So th that's just kind of an overview of how we kind of go about it. But the first one objective, it talks about providing a multimodal transportation system. Again, this is providing a transportation of choices to everyone in the air, everyone and who can and wants to kind of be in a particular area. Um, we want to integrate motorized and non-motorized transportation facilities and services in accordance with the transportation elements, basically being the transportation plan map, the county wide trails plan, the bicycle master plan, and, and the area plan text. <clears throat> Again, it also talks about HOV and HOT lanes as well. So this is kind of relates to one of the policy, um, one of the uh, objectives that you all talked about when you're in your retreat and one of the topic areas, I believe it was the first one, major legacy infrastructure projects. 
So this next one is increase in non-auto uses. So we want to support the extension of rail, uh, provide for high occupancy vehicle facilities, establish or expand park and ride facility lots, establish multimodal centers, and provide supporting facilities for mass transit, safe and convenient non-motorized facilities, for example, trails and bicycles. It even talks about uh, bicycle parking in particular locations and making sure we have enough sufficient bicycle parking to uh, accommodate the future bicycle needs of the county. <laughs> Adequate roadway access. Uh, this is um, provide adequate roadway access and capacity consistent with financial, social, and environmental constraints uh, within the, with the county's goal of reducing single occupancy vehicles. So again, we talk about providing this adequate roadway access, but then we're also caveating it by saying, well, we don't want to provide so much that we provide that we incentivize everybody driving alone. So again, so th that thing is that is caveated. So we have to use our own judgment in terms of what's kind of appropriate and what's not. This is also where they talk about um, maintaining a minimum level of service of D, except where level lower level of service may be deemed accessible. This is something that we're going to be getting into, and that we have been getting into within DOT and kind of looking at alternative metrics. So we know that level of service is probably not is not the end all be all, and it's not how we should be making all of our decisions. So we're actively looking at that now. The next one is to provide an active transportation network. We want to make sure that these are context sensitive. So. One thing that one, we do mention in that is that we talk about NACTO and MUTCD and ASHTO and VDOT. So I just threw out a bunch of acronyms for you and I'm pretty sure people are like, well, what does that mean? So NACTO is the National Association of City Transportation Officials. MUTCD is the Manual of Urban <clears throat> Uniform Traffic Control Devices. So think about that regulates signs and everything and along those lines. And then AASHTO is the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. So we use those policies and those guidelines to help guide us as we kind of put together these objective uh, these guidelines. And we want to make sure that as we do this, that we they're appropriate and context sensitive for Fairfax County. One of the things about NACTO in terms of its bicycle recommendations is they're a little bit more along the kind of the city line, looking at more urban. But Fairfax is urbanizing; it's not urban, it's not completely urban, and there's a lot of suburban and still some rural. So we want to make sure that when we develop bicycle guidelines, that they're appropriate for the county. So the next one is the promotion of transportation demand management. We do have a marketing arm within the Fairfax County Department of Transportation that actively goes out there and markets our, our TDM strategies to employers. We even have a best places to work employers. Um, but again, it talks about strategies. So we look at uh, ride sharing, HOVs, alternative forms of travel. We talk about strategies, teleworking, teleconferencing. Obviously that's new now, everyone's teleconferencing. So I think that's something that's alternative work schedules as well. Um, uh, so that's some things that we um, are definitely advocating and promoting. And, you know, unfortunately the pandemic kind of, you know, thrust us all into kind of learning that a little sooner than we wanted to, but, you know, it is something that we can all kind of learn from. I think one thing I wanted to touch on is that it even touches in rezonings as well. So it requires applicants to have analyzed and evaluated ways to implement TD which is something we do now and it's kind of it's second nature to all of our site analysis reviewers when they kind of go and look at TDM. And the one thing I want to also note is that if there's a we need to work with the with the regional council council regional governments as well as local jurisdictions to develop strategies and programs. So there is that kind of cross collaboration and and, and discussion and again that's one of your topic areas for discussion in terms of partnership and outreach. So the the next one is sorry is cost effective improvements. Um, again, this is also making sure the improvements are consistent with environmental, social, and economic goals. Uh, we want to talk. We want to prioritize improvements or make make improvements priority uh, should be given to those that advance the county's land use goals and objectives. For example, TDM or sorry TOD. Um, and we want to consider direct and indirect costs in making these decisions. And I also just wanted to make sure that this goes back to one Fairfax and the equity and what I talked about before, making sure that when we prioritize projects that we think about the community in which we're putting those projects in. And we want to make sure that the projects are appropriate for that community. The next one is protecting the environment. We, we want to avoid or minimize our impacts to the EQC's environmental, environmental quality corridors, RPAs, resource protection areas, and other environmental resources such as uh, heavy, heavily forested areas. So the RPAs and EQCs talk about steep slopes and streams as well. So we want to make sure to kind of avoid those impacts or kind of branch over them or bridge over them as I showed in the picture here. Uh, one kind of specific example I want to talk to you all was that in Lorton, the county recently completed the Lorton Road project from 123 base almost to um, I-95. 
And with that particular project, the county went and installed low impact devices. Um, basically meaning we didn't want to get outside of the right of way and install all these stormwater ponds and kind of just run the stormwater off into everywhere. So what we did is what the county did is they developed devices to treat and monitor the stormwater within the right of way or within the median. And it was turned over to VDOT just about a year and a half ago. And not only that, but, but the University of Virginia is actively monitoring those devices for us to see if we're actually achieving what we wanted to achieve, which is to re to uh, control the stormwater as it comes off the road. So I just wanted to put, point that out there that we are actively looking at the environment and making sure we kind of protect it. We also talk about identifying funding sources. And again, we are always looking for funding sources, both the Northern Virginia Transportation Association, the smart scale through VDOT, uh, Federal Transit Administration, the you know, Federal Highways Administration, others, and that others now is now new earmarks that we've kind of looked at. The uh, federal government has brought back earmarks. So we're looking to see what kind of potential projects we could have our senators and House representatives introduce into Congress for us that might be a, be a benefit to the area. Uh, again, we also talk about encouraging private sector initiatives, and we have done that with the express lanes on I-95, 495, and now I-66 being constructed now. And even even take that one step further, we've actually engaged Dominion in their assistance with the mosaic shuttles and running those electric shuttles as well. I know it's private, private public, but it's still kind of not just public dollars. And so we want to ensure the safety of users. This is the next policy. Or the next objective. This has 11 policies. This is the most robust in terms of all the policies. We really are, are trying to talk about the safety of the users. I think I only want to mention two things here is because they're kind of a little bit self explanatory. We want to reduce the conflicts between motorized and non motorized users. Um, so make sure everyone has their set their place and where they want to be, especially on a road that is a little bit more high speed, high traffic. And it also talks about incorporating medians and separate turn lanes. Um, that takes the perspective of the driver sometimes into um, into consideration. It doesn't always put for in the forefront the pedestrian or the bicyclist or the transit rider when we may not always want to introduce those types of elements. So I think that's kind of the balancing that we need to kind of think about when we're talking about these objectives. So objective 10 is maximizing the efficiency of the roads. Um, Again, this just talks about how we're making sure that we plan a grid that makes the most sense that we have uh, it being connected. So I put an example at the top. We want to have it connected do's and then don't. We don't want to have all these cul-de-sacs anymore. And we look for ways to kind of change that and, tr and try to make sure that we have the ability to kind of create a more finer grain network. One of the things the objective had talked about was making sure that we kind of provide for the, the maximum efficiency of the road network. I think what we're also finding is that that's not always we wanted, what we want to do. We want to provide for the maximum efficiency of the transportation network. We want to look at pedestrians and bicyclists and transit users as well. So if we need to have a more finer grade network to, to promote that, then I think that's something we should do. And then again, we talk about the balance of the land use and transportation. Again, this is making sure that we put the land use where we have our transportation facilities and the transportation facilities where we have our land use. So if we could direct kind of our our, high, our major growth into the active areas, for example, Tyson's and Reston into our commercial revitalization districts, that's what we're trying to help do, do that. And we're trying to put in those transportation systems that can kind of balance that. For example, the Route 1 project going on right now in or the, the BRT project going on right now in, in Richmond Highway. And then we talk about preserving land for transportation facilities. This is where our land use, um, I'm sorry, this is where our transportation plan maps come into, be, come into play, making sure that we have the appropriate maps. I showed right here an example of the soapstone connector up in Reston, and we're actively trying to move developments out of the way and move their buildings so that we can kind of make sure that we have that new overpass that's currently being designed right now. And then we talk about updating the plans. Often the objective says every five years, that's per state regulations. Um, we do that. We do it through a different manner. We kind of do dabble in pieces. Uh, we kind of take the plan in different stages. So we have something called the site specific plan amendment process, which looks at the north side and the south side. And it's kind of a way for the, us to kind of make sure that we're in keeping with the five with the five year review. Um, but again, it also we also do other ways through our area plans and through any sort of major plan updates that we do. So those are the objectives. I will try to. Sorry, I'm going to. Oh, well, I lost the slide. Um, what I'm going to do is kind of walk through quickly. Oh, so I want to do, there's a couple of recent plan updates. I just want to show you real quick. The front one on the left was the Innova ICPH, the um, Center for Personalized Health. We just completed that particular one probably in 2019. Um, and it was a big development about 
3 million square feet of development uh, just to the southeast of Gallows Road and Route 50. Um, I-485 is just to the east of there. So um, it's it's a really uh, creative and well done kind of development. We had to be very, um, we had to do a lot of analysis to get there, but it is something that's kind of more state of the art. It, it's actually meant to help with cancer and kind of making sure we do that plasma type therapy. The other one was the North Gateway one, which is right in the middle of your screen. And this is one where it was definitely transportation focused, at least for the initial onset. We looked at ways to, the, the objective was to remove the interchange at Huntington Avenue and Route 1, which is right where I'm circling now. Um, we did that through a, a kind of a hybrid approach where we looked at an alternative grid and kind of a little bit more, you I guess, unique look at turning movements to kind of make the area work. I, I think we were, um, Success, successful in, in managing to recommend that the interchange should come off the plan. Another recent one we did was Lincolnia CBC. That again also had a flyover, which we were looking to take off, but then we actually put in a little bit more land uses and kind of create a little bit more refined grid as well as a supportive bike network as well. And then one thing we want to look at is how we use the comp plan. Well, we use it for development and review. We use it for capital projects. For development review, what you're seeing on the left is Isaac Newton Square in Reston. We um, were able to kind of implement portions of the grid with our development, so they're building it and um, and opening it up to the public. Uh, that'll be coming online with our development. And the one on the right is we kind of we put the bus rapid transit uh, recommendation to the plan, and so it's now currently being uh, designed with buyer capital projects uh, division, so that it's going into implementation in the Route One corridor. And so there are transportation appendices. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of fly through them a little bit. So we have our roadway functional classification, which we have a list that is probably about a six page list in the plan that you're welcome to lo look through, but it kind of assigns classifications. In some instances, we look at those classifications and change them around and do what's called um, the multimodal kind of classification from the Department of Rail and Public Transportation, where we look at kind of doing a little emphasis on the roads. Do we do we have it be a bicycle friendly road? Do we have it be a more transit friendly road? And I'm not friendly, but more emphasizing that other aspect of it while we're still accommodating the other modes to the extent we can. Um, we also look at the type of transit service we can provide bus, BRT, light rail. We talk about bicycle and trail classifications and definitions. Again, we have kind of what they are and the facilities that are needed. Um, we talk about roadway right of requirements where we don't have plans that kind of have a cross section to tell us the right of way. We have an idea of basically how to get there, and that's basically used through either so a property owner will call us and say, hey, how much land do I need to give for this facility? And we say, oh, let me go do a quick check, and we kind of do use that as back of the envelope. Or if a development comes in and we don't have a particular plan, we can use that as back of the envelope. And again, we have the bicycle master plan as well, and that's just that's being updated currently at the active transportation plan. And so this is the crosswalk. I don't really want to spend a lot of time going into it, but what I did want to show you is that all 13 objectives and the active transportation plan, which is currently ongoing, do fit within the seven topic areas that you all have talked about. The, the major legacy projects, number one, um, you all had in there about the Silver Line and I-66 and I-495 and bus rapid transit. And the objective one is provide a multimodal transportation system and objective two is increase non auto use. So that's exactly what we're trying to do. So that's just kind of a representative example. And I just kind of want to point that out there. What I also want to note is that these policies and these objectives could use updating. Uh, we're aware of that. I think your topics are hit, hit right on the head in terms of being able to help us update those when the time is ripe. Um, so with that leading to the next slide, the next steps for this. I want to point out again, it's not board authorized, so we don't have a timeline for, timeline for implementation. But it's kind of the review, and this is how we would go about doing it. We would review, review the policy plan. Uh, I put in here all sections because we want to look at the whole policy plan, maybe not just transportation, but we obviously could be the um, the focus on transportation. And also with that, we want to look at area plan guidance because there's a lot of cross reference. and We want to make sure there's no conflicts. Uh, we would update the text as needed. Um, we would or reorganize and streamline as needed too. Sometimes not all of this stuff needs to be in text. Sometimes it's better in maps. Sometimes it allows us to better update it that way. Um, and then what? From that point on, we would do public outreach, and this is where we would look for the for the TAC for assistance with the community, getting the word out, helping educate the public, um, getting us you know getting us that next step. Um, we would review and revise based on community feedback again with the TAC as well, and then from there we would update the policy plan in the future, but all and then go to the board for authors for opt adoption. So that's kind of our next step. What we would do, and that's kind of where we are. Well, I don't recognize any of the people on that. Uh... That's green there. Uh, they don't look like commissioners. <laughs> you know, I have to ask some questions. <laughs> um, commissioners, uh, uh, open up for uh, for questions. Jeremy, 
Yeah, um, I was interested in what, if any, coordination happens with neighboring jurisdictions as part of the comp plan. Does it does it just happen when something's getting developed? I know, like with what Falls Church or other cities or the county, other counties are doing. Is that taken into account? So, yes, we do use a lot of projects to kind of help with the coordination, but we do actively go and have coordination meetings. Uh, recently, I think within the past two months, we had a coordination meeting with the city of Alexandria in which they showed us all their projects. We showed us all our projects and we've showed them before. So they were just mainly updates and kind of talking about how we can kind of talk about cr cross collaboration and, and along those lines. Um, we've actively worked with Loudoun County as well, Prince William County. We, we work with all of our neighboring jurisdictions. So it's a continuing basis. Yes, a lot of the projects do kind of spur that conversation to occur. For example, in Seven Corners right now, we're talking with the city of Falls Church and Arlington County on the Seven Corners phasing plan. So those are kind of, um, th that is kind of how it's done. But when we do find a need, we de definitely make sure that we are coordinating in advance. Um, but again, I will say a lot of the projects do help with that coordination because it gives us something to talk about. The other thing I would add was that we're also obviously a member of the Metropolitan Washington COG, which every regional partner is also a member of that. So um, there is a high level of coordination that goes on through that body as well. Thanks. Um, my second question was, I was interested in the, the frequency of the updates. You said every five years, I assume that you're not looking at every single parcel and deciding if it's updated. How, is that is that prioritizing that process? Is that part of the community feedback? How do you approach that? So this the state law, the Commonwealth law says we're we're supposed to do it every five years. The way the county has chosen to do it is we do the site specific plan amendment process, and that replaced the area plans review. And I don't know how many of you are around for that, but don't, don't worry about it. Um, but we <laughs> what we do what we do is we go through a process where we look at the north of the county, so we look at the top four districts, and then we look at the south of the county, so the bottom five districts, and they're kind of reviewed about every four years, five years, so it kind of keeps within that five year flow. So and during that timeline, we allow for any there's parameters set but we allow for nominations to come in to kind of look at the look at the land use and kind of change that and with that we also look at the transportation components that are part of it and so that kind of helps get at the five year cyclical process but then we also look at areas of the county that need reevaluation um, every so often for example we're currently right now looking in the lorton area we are also currently about ready to uh, possibly look at the Fairfax Center area. This is going to be our phase three look. We just wrapped, we're wrapping up McLean now. We're looking at West Falls Church now. So we have active areas going on and even Reston right now is in for a, pl for a plan reevaluation as well. So all of that kind of occurs as the supervisors kind of dictate it to us, but we do have a process for the community to be involved. Thanks. Okay. Mike, go ahead. Mike, if you could uh, uh, revisit the, uh, there, were, there were two things that caught my uh, ear there. The, uh, under the protect the environment of, and collecting the stormwater on, on 95, and then also the uh, ANOVA facility, what you did there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just go, I'll just go to the ANOVA facility. Um, so, um, you want to know about this one particular? Just, uh, what, what you said, uh, what were the, the objectives there that you accomplished? So the objectives were, is that this was the old Exxon site and Nova had purchased the site and they owned a bunch. They obviously are across the street in the hospital. So they're over here for everyone's context. Um, so the Exxon facility existed at these particular buildings right here and this one as well and they wanted to come in and they wanted to do a kind of a cancer institute or cancer research and so they bought the site and they were able to kind of put in all this kind of supportive structure of that of infrastructure for that and so they put in a nursing school there's also talk with um i believe the university of virginia to put in the business or engineering program up here as well to kind of have it be multi um, kind of a multi-use center um and so with that, we kind of we it was a it was part of the SSPA process that I mentioned before. So they kind of nominated the site and the county's goal was to make sure that this site worked well, integrated well with the community and that all the 
all the transportation impacts from my perspective were evaluated and mitigated to the extent they could. So we did do that. We looked at kind of obviously dispersing the traffic along Gallows Road. And we also looked at kind of improvements you don't see here, but there's another street called wellness over here and making sure we kind of had some improvements over there. We also looked at I-495 itself and the ramp, as you guys, I'm going to point it right here, it comes off the screen, but we looked at kind of improvements to that as well as the improvements to the interchange down here at Gallows Road and I-495. So all that was under evaluation for, for the vehicular improvements. But then we also looked at pedestrian and bicycle improvements too. We actually had them, um, we put in a cycle track along their entire frontage along Gallows Road along here, and we had them upgrade and um, improve the pedestrian and bicycle facilities along the other other side of Gallus Road, all the way up to and across the 495 bridge. So that's kind of what we looked at in that in that regard for the Innova site. Is that where the sports facility and the, and the vaccination center and that on that campus there? I'm not aware of a sports facility over there. Yes, there was sports it medicine. Okay, sports, uh, it is a sports yeah. medicine. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, sports medicine is there. That's correct. Sorry. And that, if they have a weekend clinic now for the vaccinations. They used right. to have a daily clinic, but that's all moved to Eisenhower now. But yes, that's in in one of the old Exxon uh, buildings that was right okay. on campus. Okay, and then the uh, the environmental one with the storm water off. Was it ninety five that you did it? So that one was it was Lorton Road just off of 123 as you approach 95 and, and so it's in the Lorton area. Um, it's close to the uh, Workhouse Road, which is recently reproved and to the in Lorton Arts. So what they what the county did and the county designed it too, is they kind of they drew a line for the right of way and they said, OK, all we want low impact devices. We want to make sure that we are mitigating the stormwater and the runoff kind of the quality of it within the actual right of way of the road so they installed all these devices within the road along the edge of it running parallel to the road instead of having these stormwater ponds that you kind of see in some of the new designs in addition they kind of they installed bioswales and other things in the median as well to kind of direct the water into the median to kind of help treat it there so the goal was to treat and control the water within the right of way itself not have to buy off-site credits and nutrient credits and not have to do any stormwater ponds. So at, at this point, it's been turned over to VDOT for maintenance and it's been UVA is currently monitoring it to make sure that the, the devices are doing what they said they would do. So this is a little bit state of the art for the county. We haven't done this before. So it is it is a pilot program that we're doing. So it could, uh, you know, could be picked up by other uh, localities as well. Then. Absolutely. And we're, yeah. And maybe we could pick it up in other locations of the county too. It helps minimize our right of way impacts as well, which is the other reason we kind of looked at it too. Okay, now that's interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, next commissioner with a question. I have a question. Can you hear me? Alexis, yes. I can hear you. Great. Um, thanks, thanks, Mike, um, for the presentation. And my question is about funding. You mentioned you all are always looking for funding. And um, my understanding is that uh, that you know a lot of the funding comes from the Northern Virginia Transportation um, Authority, and they have they have tended in the past to not score projects that are solely non-vehicular very high, or to get it don't, they don't appropriate a lot of funding to projects that are kind of standalone uh, aside from road projects like. If a road widening project has a side path, it will get a high mark, but a side path on its own or a trail on its own doesn't get high funding or high scoring and therefore doesn't get funding. Uh, could you talk about, could you talk a little more about that? Is that, is that the case? Is there, if it, if it is, is there change on the horizon for that? Is there a change in thinking? I know that, you know, they're bound by things like the transaction plan that, you know, kind of have these somewhat vague guidelines around like, well, we want to reduce congestion, but how they do it isn't necessarily, you know, clear. Um, so I'm just curious what your your point of view of it on that is. And unfortunately, I think you, you're definitely, you're correct in basically all of it. Congestion relief is a major criteria for them. And when you look at a sidewalk and a trail project, it's hard for us to kind of say how congestion relief is going to occur when we install that project. We have a lot of the metrics again are looking at um, kind of the road and and along those lines. So knowing that we kind of have sometimes take a different tact with it. We kind of put the projects that are ripe for NVTA into that particular category. 
we look to fund the other projects, the trails, the sidewalks projects through maybe local means through um, uh, either through C and I funds or whatever is available for us that we can use to. It all depends on you know what the um, money is available for, where the stipulations are. But I will also say that Smart Scale, the state um, program, is actually changing a little bit, and they're actually going to start looking at hopefully prioritizing the pedestrian and bicycle projects as well to command, make those a little bit more competitive in the pro, in the process. Again, it is a statewide process, so it, it's going to be a little difficult, but until they can, we can find ways to kind of siphon out a pot, you know, pots of the money that are directed more towards pedestrian and bicycle facilities, it's going to be a little bit difficult for those projects to compete. So we just have to be a little bit more thoughtful on how, and the money that we do allocate and kind of where we go about getting it. Thank you. Do we have uh, um, other questions, perhaps? Um, I have a couple, but I'll, I'll wait till all the commissioners have, have asked their questions. Um, okay. Um, well, um, I very much appreciate this. Um, and you, you look at the report here, you look at the, the, the briefing here, it's very clear why Tom Bassani wanted us to have this. This is exactly the kind of uh, 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 corollary to this with what we've done. And I really appreciate you. Uh, uh, here at if you could on 24 um you know lay out some of the uh the cross hatchings uh you know the cross flow process what we put together um and what uh, uh and, and what the comprehensive plan looks like one of the big important things that we want to do as we look at uh, areas to focus on it's simple but it's important we want to make sure you don't forget something <laughs> not necessarily we will do everything because we know we can't you know that very very well too um but uh we want the uh, spending less time on something to be a conscious choice, not just an oversight. And so um, being able to compare our plans, our merging plans with the comprehensive plan is, is very helpful in that area. Um, you know, in fact, uh, uh, maybe what we should just do is uh, uh, we'll just let you write our, uh, our uh, report to the board and we'll be all done. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Um, but one thing, there was two things I wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, I don't want to get into it too much, and we're because uh, I know we've got another topic here, and and we're constantly sort of trying to balance everything out. But two thing, one thing I wanted to uh, to mention, another one to ask just a little bit about is, uh, well, actually, ask about a couple of things. One of the uh, uh, guiding principles that uh, we've uh, uh, suggested for the TAC is. Uh, um, that we're integrating and informing transportation proven priorities with economic development. I didn't see that here. Um, is that something that you guys are considering putting in the comprehensive plan? Is that something that it doesn't quite fit? I'm just kind of wondering what you think about sort of the economic development underpinnings. Because one of the things we notice as we look at these various uh, locations, yes, Tyson's and and uh, particularly uh, you know the uh, uh, the Silver Line is an important piece there. But there are other places where we want to make sure we're talking about what's happening economically. Yeah, and these policies, and I didn't kind of touch on it too much, but a lot of them will mention kind of the social aspects of it and even the commerce part of it. Even our goal up front actually talks okay. about making sure that we have commerce as part of it. We make sure we integrate these policies accordingly. So, yeah, yes, we do take into account the economic development of it. And I think it's inherently there as well when we try to um, – Put the actual development where the infrastructure is that we're there trying to incentivize use of that infrastructure. For mm -hmm. example, the silver line, the county mm -hmm. and, you know, actively put in billions of dollars in there. So we're trying to direct the growth into there. So I think from the standpoint of trying to, you know. Be good stewards of the taxpayer money dollar and everything we are doing that. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. It, it, and, and certainly we've got a, a number of areas where our emphasis, our language is a little bit different. That's what you'd expect. So I appreciate that. Um, the other thing I wanted to sort of uh, uh, tease a little bit here, so to speak, um, is complete streets. Um, and uh, Jeff, we talked about that a little bit when we chatted last week. I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to talk about that. I know there's much work to be done, um, but it's obviously something that uh, a number of our uh, 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 you know, some, uh, members of the board of supervisors are, are interested in. It's an important topic. Um, yes, Deputy County Executive Flynn is also interested in it, um, but there's a reason she's interested in that in that topic. Um, and one of the things I like to do and, and sort of plan to see for uh, going forward is that as we move more into, you know, in some of these complete streets area, um, is perhaps uh, we certainly want to work with you and, and uh, you know, bring you in, involved appropriately in that in the part of the conversation. We could, what's your thoughts on sort of some of these next steps for complete streets as you go forward? Just picking one of the things that you, you know, can focus on. 
I might, Mike, I might take this one um, since we sure. chat about it. Um, so the complete streets um, as a term um, is um, there's a whole whole host of policy and guidance behind what what does complete streets mean? And uh, as a county, we've taken a look at our policy plan and other guidance and standards and, and said, are, are we accomplishing that same goal of a complete streets policy? And what we found was that we have everything there. We have the kit of parts. Um, it's just not called a complete streets document. And so what we're going to suggest we do, and Mike has kind of laid out that that um, plan here is to when we go to modify our policy plan, that seems to be the best place for us to insert a complete streets ish type document. I don't I don't even know if we'll call it a complete yeah. streets policy. <laughs> we'll just call it our transportation policy document because that's really what it is. It's our transportation policy. Other other jurisdictions in the area have done something similar. I think Alexandria might be the closest um, one that did that. They put a complete streets policy document together and then they said well wait we got to put it into our other plan and so they just inserted it into their comprehensive plan and now it sits in their transportation plan as a, as a complete streets document so instead of going that direction we may just skip the step of making the policy and just go straight into the policy plan and insert it there so it, what mike did was he laid out what our you know our intended steps with that for that would be um the department of planning and development has a yearly schedule for how they um how they decide what their work schedule is and it was just recently approved in the past couple of months by the board um, and it is a yearly schedule so one of the things that was not on this year schedule just because there's so much other things that the board has wanted us to do uh, was a update to the policy plan but um, it is something that i know barbara uh, byron and uh, uh, dpd's director as well as uh, tom bashani our director um, have in in their minds is that we may try and initiate something in the next in the coming year um, to get working on that. And um, that's that's what Mike is alluding to is a review of the policy plan, all sections there. Um, so that I think that's coming, um, but I, it's not on the immediate like next few months type of horizon. So we'll be introducing it internally to sort of talk about what is necessary, what would be our staffing needs, timing needs, schedule, things of that nature. But I don't anticipate us actually ramping anything up for you know at least six months, if not longer. Okay. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. And, and uh, certainly, uh, um, you know, it, it's, it's actually um, it's nice to say it's a work in progress that uh, we're joining the conversation at a good time. So it's, it's uh, not so far along that you're done, but also far enough along that um, we're sort of can speak the same language and try to put some sort of things together there. So uh, that's very encouraging. And, and just to go back for a minute, uh, uh, some of the commissioners are talking about uh, uh, some of our work plan priorities and uh, this is the one we uh, handed out uh, last month still a work in progress itself of course you know one of the areas we'd highlighted was future road design parameters complete streets etc so um, this helps us uh, uh, focus on the areas that you know, we attack we might be our, our highest and best use of things like that so that's that's very very helpful um, are there any other questions uh, from commissioners yet? Uh, Pete, I see. Yeah, it's, it's the reason why I didn't bring it up. It wasn't a question, it was more of a comment. <laughs> okay, so please feel. Uh, in my, uh, one, when Mike talked about uh, uh, North Gateway, as we call it, uh, Richmond Highway near the Beltway, uh, where they put in the hybrid plus plan to keep a, uh, frankly, to keep that area viable for revitalization. I just really wanted to thank thank the team for working on that, but that, that was a long pull and they got a really good job done. So appreciate it. Um, I got excited when I heard him, uh, if I heard him right, was talking about whether they're visiting LRF and thinking about using something else. And I'm hoping that's that's what I heard because uh, uh, to get these complete streets and make more than main streets, uh, that's gonna be needed. Otherwise, you know, BDOT's gonna keep them in things the way they are. Um, and basically that was my comment, but thank you very much for the presentation. Um, Mike, Roger? this is Kelly. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, Roger first and then, then Kelly. Well, Kelly can go ahead. Kelly? I'll okay. be quick, Roger, thank you. You're such a gentleman, Roger, I appreciate it. Um, so tired. for Mike, 
for Mike and Jeff, um, what do you need as staff from this commission? What do you need to hear from us? And in what format do you want to hear it so that we can assist you in accordance with what our directive is? Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'll, well, I'll offer two things and I'll let Jeff kind of chime in too. I think one of the, the first thing we do is Definitely go back and look at the crosswalk that we did to see how the objectives kind of relay overlap with your topic areas and, and see how our objectives could possibly be updated. I'm not saying we do it if you, if you, we can do it now, but how we can update them in the future to better reflect kind of some of what you all believe to be, you know, policies that should be put forth. The other aspect of that is to actually when the time is is ripe is to go ahead and talk to your community and really get them engaged in this process. Um, we only go as far as the community is willing to engage us and you know obviously an engagement right now has been difficult um especially with the pandemic but even engagement when we come out of it is still going to be something that we're going to find challenging and we're going to need assistance with so um i know these topics aren't always the most I exciting but sometimes we will try our best to make them that way and we, with your help you know bring them on bring them along uh, i think the only thing i would add to that is that um you we, Mike and I listened to uh, your um, all all the uh, conversation that happened um, at your. I think you called it an offsite, uh, yeah. even though you were everybody was offsite. Um, I still did a work session, <laughs> aka offsite. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Um, and I thought it was good conversation. We picked up a lot of information on that. And I I, I mentioned this to Chich Um One of the uh, things that I I found really interesting was when he mentioned sort of the conversation he had had with his board member that um, mm -hmm, elected, yeah. elected him to this position to say, what, why are you on this and what, what would I like you to work on? I think it's it would be interesting for us to hear more about um, what others have had as that conversation as well with their board members, because that helps us to understand where you're coming from as far as the suggestions and recommendations you make. Um, so I, if you were, if you had some information that you could provide to us through Calvin, um, I think that would be fantastic to sort of get some more information on that. Um, it's, it's a great conversation to have, and I think probably everybody's had a very similar conversation with their board member, but you never know if there's just some gem in there that you're like, Ooh, that's a really great idea. And we would want to, you know, capitalize on, on that excitement, uh, that you would bring to us. Appreciate that very much. And. And you know, one of the things that I think uh, helps is that uh, um, as we put our work plan together, uh, as we try and you know look at areas to focus on, um, it's obvious that that we're going to be uh, uh, keying off uh, a lot of what's in the comprehensive plan. So as we talk about our priorities, we can't help but talk about the comprehensive plan, its relationship to it, and things like that. Uh, and that crosswalk is a, is of immense value. Um, and I thank you again, and particularly in a large group here. To uh, to admit that you spent six hours listening to us go on and on, we barely could stand ourselves for that long. So for you to do that, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time and doing your work there. That's uh, that's extremely helpful. <laughs> we did it on fast forward. It was on fast forward. You were talking oh, very fast. Like, no, I'm just exactly. you were talking exactly. Mike speed. You were talking Mike speed. The the New Yorker here, even though he's not from New York, he talked at New York speed today. That was that was very impressive, Mike. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm sure as, as, as the commissioners are learning. Yes. <laughs> I did, I did get it all in there for you all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the other Mike, exactly. Even more so, precisely. Yes, um, that was very good, Mike. You were you were you were good. So, um, well, uh, I, I do want to move on to our to our other topic. Uh, uh, we certainly could go deeper here, but but let, let, let's not for a variety Mike, of reasons. Um, yes, go ahead. Mike, don't forget that Roger Please. stepped down to let me speak. <laughs> of course, of course. Thank you for stepping up for Roger. Because I was about to. Hey, say, right. I owe you a favor. Just, I, Mike and and Jeff. I no, I think topics are very exciting. But we use these terms kind of loosely. What what do you see as a complete street? I have an idea of what one is, but I'm interested in what you think it is. I'll give you an example. I think Seminary Road between Mark Center and Quaker Lane is pretty close to a complete street. Uh, Sleepy Hollow Road in Fairfax is about as incomplete a street as you can find anywhere. Now, where in, within that dichotomy do you see a complete street? Or am I completely wrong? 
I guess I'll, I'll start by answering that one by saying that the complete street depends on the context of the area that surrounds it. And what I mean by that is you need to ensure that all users that are going to be traveling through that area are accommodated in some fashion. Some are going to be accommodated more than others. Um, you know, if you're going to really encourage this to be a pedestrian uh, type street, you're going to have to overcompensate and make sure that the pedestrians are the ones that are accommodated the most and that others other modes are maybe deselected as the priority emphasis. That's something that we've seen in um, the Department of Rail and Public Transportation's guidance for creating uh, street standards uh, for our urban areas is that they really wanted us to place modal emphasis on places. And you can have multi multiple modes that are emphasized, but you can't say that I'm going to be able to accommodate every single mode on every single street. It's just impossible to do because every time you you elevate one, another one has to take a slightly back seat to that. So the the term multimodal, I think, is is a farce, <laughs> uh, and I wouldn't and I wouldn't believe it um, because you really can't truly be multimodal. You really have to encourage certain modes over others to make sure that um, the safety is there for. Uh, those more vulnerable users. So um, if you're going to prioritize vehicular movement, like on a corridor like I-95, you have to understand that that's not a great place for pedestrians. And that's OK, but that's the priority that's been placed on I-95. The same thing would go for a local street that's in a residential suburb. You have to be placing the emphasis on the, the students that are walking to school in that neighborhood or you know something like that. So you really have to take a look at the users and the surrounding uh, land use to really make a determination on what it is now and what it needs to be in the future. And the only thing I'll add on my personal perspective is that I always talk in terms of a complete network of streets and they don't always have a complete street everywhere. Because again, as Jeff said, we can't accommodate on all users on every street, but what we should be able to do is provide a network to accommodate all users within a particular area or areas. So while we don't emphasize them in one area, they should be emphasized in a way that can allow them to to get in and throughout the entire area being evaluated or, the, or their community. I think an example of that would be the I-66 corridor inside the Beltway, where you have the Custis Trail running right alongside it. You may not have to accommodate cyclists on Interstate 66 because they essentially have the Custis Trail, which is very heavily used uh, and gets you to the same place. Yet they're separated from automobile and bus traffic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you, Roger. Sorry for uh, uh, barging right through there, Kelly. Appreciate you, at, um, you know, at, um, repaying the favor with Roger there. Um, I will just one quick observation as we uh, as we as we end. Um, Jeff, uh, you know, uh, understand uh, uh, it's a little hard to use the phrase uh, multimodal of farce in any official documents. I didn't say exactly what you mean. Mike, I got to say, complete network of streets. I like that phrase. That that makes some sense. That might, that might be something that finds its way in some of our documents that maybe some of you are using already. Um, but uh, I, I like that. Roger, appreciate the question to uh, to sort of generate that that conversation. That was that was helpful. If there's at this point, I don't think I've overlooked anybody else at this point. I'll, I'll overlook somebody else later. But for now, I think I'm caught up. Um, Mike, Jeff, thank you so much. We'll certainly uh, be in touch. We'll uh, we'll do the crosswork. You've given us some homework assignments here. Uh, we'll have some some follow up conversations. Please keep us posted on your on your schedule and things like that. Um, and uh, uh, to your channel, uh, uh, Commissioner Westenhoff, let us know what you need. Let us know when things are coming up. I know we'll be communicating, but also uh, um, as you look for ways to try and put your pieces together, please uh, give me a call. We can bring it back at, at any time to have these kind of conversations. Uh, I think this is an important, uh, important topic here. Very much so. Thank you for your time this right. evening. Have a good evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right. Okay. So now moving on to the uh, uh, public comment period. Um, are there any members of the public here who would like to comment for up to two minutes each? Either on the phone or I don't believe we see anybody on the uh, on the the webex. We don't. We don't have any uh, public member here. Okay. In that case, we'll move on to uh, our, our second topic. Um, and this is a, um, uh, this is a, a, I'll call it a special topic. And, and what I mean by that is that um, we have here uh, two commissioners um, who have taken the, the effort to, uh, to dive into this, uh, to uh, pick up on a conversation we had before. 
Um, and I come up with some things for us to talk about uh, some, some things for the commission to consider uh, um, adopting. When I first started doing it, uh, um, you know, there were some, some pieces there in, in, the, in the last meeting and uh, uh, a number of us, I remember particularly uh, uh, Commissioner Hancock talking about wanting to have some actual things and you know, some things we can sort of think our teeth into. And, and these are certainly those kinds of topics. Um, they run the risk of getting into some depth. Um, I think we'll probably, you know, be diving pretty deeply into bike issues and things like that here. That's okay. Uh, we'll have to pull back a little bit. There's only so much time for uh, for tonight. Um, but also, though, the, the timing is is very serendipitous. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is that uh, when we first scheduled the uh, the topic here, um, we knew that the active Fairfax folks were not going to be able to join us this evening, even though we're talking about potentially making some changes here. But we wanted to go forward anyway because we wanted to have commissioners, uh, uh, you know, talk amongst themselves. Uh, and Kelly had made that suggestion in particular to to you know see what we think. And I think that's very important, particularly as we've got some things here as we say to sort of sink our teeth into. But sort of off to the side without us doing anything. Um, Tom Bassani uh, came to us and said and asked if we'd be able to uh, please have a, a special session on May the 4th because the active Fairfax group is going to the Board of Supervisors on, on May the 25th. Um, and they'd like to bring some things to us. They'd like to talk to us. Um, and, and I think in the circumstances, it was uh, uh, impossible for me to say no. Um, I did check with a couple of commissioners um, who have some availability. It obviously would be a work session, so there's no uh, no obligation to uh, to attend. But I mentioned that now one for for context, but also some of the topics, some of the conversation here, we'll need to have with the active Fairfax folks when they come in on, on May the fourth. So my goal here is for us to talk about things, maybe frame things up a little bit about the kind of things we might want to do, how deep we want to get into things, how comfortable we are in this topic area and getting into it and, and what kind of recommendations we want to make and stuff like that. As I talk about a special topic, what I mean is, is the first time we're really sort of getting into some, some substance here um, for, for explicit recommendations, taking those actions we've talked about. So I think it's worth spending maybe a little extra time if we need it, you know, to, to feel comfortable about here because this could be a model probably would be a model for the kind of things we do and the ways we do going forward. Not, not a straight jacket, but you know, maybe a guidepost or something like that. Um, and so uh, I'd like to you know, open up the conversation. I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Alexis and Kelly to, uh, uh, to, to open up the conversation. Um, and let's just dive in and, and see where the conversation goes. And at some point we're gonna have to uh, uh, you know, abandon it as it gets too late. Um, we're scheduled to finish about 9.15. We can go at least a, a little bit later. We've got a few things later on. Uh, but I think this is uh, this is important, so I appreciate again Kelly and Alexis for doing this. For that, I'll turn it over to you and and uh, let you decide uh, who's going to uh, uh, start the talking and uh, look forward to the conversation. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, this is largely born out of me trying to come up with something concrete that we can actually do. Um, these are just possible topics. They aren't something that if the whole board isn't interested in talking about with the various agencies that we have to do just because I think it's a good idea. So, um, Calvin, if you could go to the next one. Thank you. Um, the topics in this one are mobility through areas of construction, TAC requests for data, public private spaces, and resolving questions regarding enforcement of law and pedestrian car crashes. Next one. That the last one is that the uh, Kevin Morris Memorial Policy, I guess, maybe. <laughs> Kevin did inspire some of this, yes. Um, <laughs> honored, okay. honored to uh, speed that along. Yeah. So as we're looking at the um, Active Fairfax, we want to know what kind of requirements they have for mobility through construction. Um, this is an example of a place. The one on the left is on West Ox, and it was where they had completely blocked the path while they fixed the path. And they did not put out any red cones or anything like that. So if you stepped into the road, you had your back to 40 plus mile per hour traffic. And that was for pedestrians or cyclists. And it was a one day project. It would have been simple to do cones. I think it just didn't even occur to them. The one on the right is much more serious because it is a two to three month delay. It's done by Dominion Power and it is on a signed um, commuter trail. This is on Fairfax County Parkway um, at Baron Cameron and Eldon. And it directs people onto, whether it's pedestrian or bicycle, it, it directs them into a gravel area that is also the access point for all the heavy equipment coming in. 
Um, we've raised the issue. They have posted a phone number you can call for the project manager. Um, that has not proven to be very fruitful. So I'm not, I'm trying to not whine and complain about these particular issues, but instead say, if these are happening in Reston, which is the Silver Line Corridor, which is supposed to be this holy grail of how we're doing things correctly, then they're happening all over the county. And that doesn't seem fair to the non-car user. So next one, please. So if this had been a road project, there are very specific rules about how they have to sign it, how about they have to redirect traffic. Um, it's very concrete. And so our question is, why not have something that concrete that's part of the plan for Act of Fairfax that says this is a standard because we value these trail users and path users um, as much as we do road users. Next. Um, this is also in Reston, and it's a near perfect example where they're doing a development along uh, Reston Parkway and the toll road and Sunrise Valley, and they have done this amazing. Uh, number one is where it's signed. Number two is where the path they've laid down asphalt. Number three is kind of how they've put up the concrete barriers. And number four is the best part because they had they had messed up where they put the cut over back to the path. And, and had paved it, but it was not in the right location. So they'd done another one right here in gravel. Um, several of us raised the point that gravel was not sufficient to get people back up onto the path, especially if they're in wheelchairs and mobility impaired, and they went back and paved it. And this is brilliant. This is exactly what we want. We want this kind of response. Um, they didn't post something, say, here's the phone number to call. But other than that, this one's pretty good. Go on. So our recommendation is that the active Fairfax plan should require a similar standard. Same thing you do for cars. Let's do the same thing for multimodal, even though they don't like that term, uh, for non-car users. Um, and then there's some very specific recommendations. And that's one reason I wanted to, to go out to each of you. So you can take a look at it and think about it and see if this is something you embrace. But again, the idea isn't here that everybody has to embrace every part of this. This is an example of the type of thing that we should be able to somehow ask um, the folks who make these plans to include or not include based on whether all the commissioners agree. So next Kelly, one, Calvin. You, you taking Sorry. questions now or at the end? Um, let me just try to get through it, please. And then, sure. um, yeah, and just jot down your questions because I'm I'm a little concerned. I have a lot of slides and not much time, and I don't want to belabor it. Go ahead. Um, okay. So next one. So then the second recommendation. Um, this one's one that Alexis felt strongly about. Which um, do you want to talk about this one, Alexis? Sure. Um, I'll just mention, yeah, the, the 301 service is, I think, really key because, you know, it's, it's so often that we're out and about and we encounter these issues and, you know, what do you do when you're in the wild and and there's an issue? It's, um, and you know, jurisdictions that neighbor us, like City of Alexandria and D.C., do have services like this um, where they are very responsive. The, the municipalities are very responsive to these kinds of things. Um, and I think that we need it in VDOT. You know, VDOT is very responsive on their my VDOT, whatever that address is, .virginia.gov, where you can report, for example, a pothole. I've reported potholes and they've been fixed the next day or within mm -hmm. 48 hours. But I don't, you know, I can't do this for a sidewalk issue or um, a construction issue. So I, I feel pretty strongly, yeah, that, that Fairfax County and or VDOT, um, you know, should, you know, bring, come to the standard and make it equitable for all all the, the users that they serve out there to have this kind of service. Great, thank you. Okay, Calvin, go on, please. Um, so the second topic is request for data. How should we as a body be asking for the data that might cross agencies? So if we wanna know the nexus between the type of road and fatal crashes, who are we talking to and what is it what's the information we 
want to find. And our problem, I think, is that we don't quite know how to package that and send it to the right folks. Um, Alexis, did you want to add to that? I'll just add that the data is really hard to access and review. Um, there's there's a lot of different systems. There's a system with DMV, there's systems with CDOT, there's systems with the county, um, and it's from all different dates. It, they collect different, they have different data points. Um, so it's kind of hard to quantify things. That's, that's what, I guess, a separate issue. Um, but yeah, when, when we are looking at the stuff and, and see an issue or have an issue or have a question about this data and what it means, you know, it, 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 I think you're right, Kelly, what you said, like, who do we go to and how do we address it is, has always been a question that I've, I've run into looking at these things. Okay. So do I go to Thank the, you. do I go to the police? Do I, do I go to FCDOT? Do I go to VDOT? Um, you know, there's so many different jurisdictions over these, you know, all, over our right of ways. It's, it's, it's sometimes very unclear and hard to know what the best path is. Okay. Okay, Calvin, next one, please. This is our third topic, and this is the issue of public private spaces, which is a really big deal along the silver line and will probably be a bigger deal as some of the other areas in the county get more highly developed. That there's this kind of, um, shall I call it an unholy deal <laughs> that is made with developers that allows them these um, really long term leases. So that they will develop, for instance, the platform in the plaza, not the platform, the plaza at uh, Wheelie Reston Station. Well, what that gives them is private rights. And so this is kind of a situation that uh, I encountered that, you know, they're, they're just, they don't allow any bikes on, on the plaza and they'll cut your lock and take your bike, even though they actually have bike parking. And so my question is, what, is the response, wait, not what, but who, who should the response be made to? Who should be monitoring that kind of thing? Does that fall under an active Fairfax plan? It's nothing, there's nothing about it in the bike parking guidelines. There's nothing about it that I have found in any other piece. So maybe this is something that we can suggest to active Fairfax that they incorporate that this issue of land use doesn't mean that the private party gets to do what they want. It's not a fiefdom. It's it should be uh, access friendly to people who are using bikes and not just leaving them there for weeks. But okay, so next one. Um, and that one actually comes under well should come under the Fairfax County Bi bicycle parking guidelines. It classifies bike parking. Um, it tells minimum requirements based on square footage. And if you talk to folks in their office, they will tell you that the bike parking guidelines are actually kind of weak and they would like to strengthen them. So this could be an area in which we could assist them by standing behind them as they do try to assert more control over the quality and the quantity of bike parking um, on commercial properties. It's also, like I put on the bottom, it's also an equity issue. All of these are extreme equity issues. Those um, places where the trails were blocked in the first couple of slides, those are major corridors for low-income workers. And they're never gonna call VDOT and say, hey, I can't get around. They're gonna figure out some way to do it and it may not be safe. Okay, next one, Calvin. So our recommendation in this is we need to ask FCDOT, how's the best way to let, address these issues that are left hanging? Is it active Fairfax? Is it land use? Are there incentives for property management and owners to come into compliance? Again, we really don't know who to ask or how to ask. And so if the active Fairfax plan can sort of draw those in and give us those, not just us, but, but the public, the vehicle to say, this is wrong and I would like to know how to address it, then they know where to go. Right now it's just, you know, you go into alphabet soup trying to find it. Okay, next one. Um, this is something that we were both interested in as well was the enforcement of law in crashes. There are new um, laws coming into effect in July 
And again, they're going to be the kind of thing where. Um, yes, bicyclists have more protection under the law. But if there's an interaction between a bicycle and a car, it's usually the bicyclist who has been whisked off to the hospital. And then the police officer asks whoever's there what happened. And many, many times, uh, whether it's, you know, and actually, Roger, this is the one that made me think of you is the I didn't see him. Well, if you didn't see him, then you weren't paying attention or the lighting is bad or something else was going on. But that doesn't assess fault. And we would like to be able to ask those people who are responding to these accidents and crashes. You know, what, what are the variables here? How do we track this? How do we look at this? Because with data, then we can help uh, FCDOT make good recommendations as they go forward with the active Fairfax plan. Uh, next. Um, oh, this is the law. There's, um, this is the new law where if someone stopped at a, 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 a crosswalk, then every other car needs to stop as well. I always thought this was just common sense, but apparently they had to make it an actual law and that'll start in July. And I'm very curious as to how they're going to enforce it. Um, but I just thought I'd give you guys a Virginia law so that when you can review this on your own, you can look at it and go, oh, that's what the law says. Next, please. Well, that must have been a snowstorm. <laughs> Was that it, Calvin? I think that's all the slides. Oh, interesting. Yes, that was okay. it. That was it. Yeah. Okay. I. All right. That's all I have to say. So I think it was Kevin who had questions. But Mike, I'll let you do the question and answer. Oh well. Well, well thanks, sir. Uh, Kevin. Uh, you want to start this? Sure. Uh, Kelly and Alexis, that was excellent. Um, really did a nice job on that. Um. Just from memory here on the on the first one, I was wondering. I mean, you're right. The the, the general public, their path is blocked. If they use it, they're not going to know who to call. But in any of these examples, did did either of you reach out to the the project manager and say, uh, you know, what why did you do this or why didn't you account for this? I did talk to the guys at West Ox and asked them if they could just put out some cones and. Um, they just looked at me like they did not understand what I was saying to them. Um, for the project on Baron Cameron, that's more long term. We have called the project manager from Dominion, and um, we've called. I've called uh, Fairfax County DOT, and I've called VDOT, and I've called my supervisor, and <laughs> it's still the same. Well, I think, and you can't call on every project, so I think I think what you proposed here is is probably the way to go. And you know, it actually just seems like common sense to me. Not, I don't know what the reaction would be on you know the other side about saying, well, that's going to put up, you know, a, a kibosh on the whole project that we're doing here, or it's going to add weeks. I don't I don't know what kind of pushback you might get, but I, I think your you know your your approach is is correct. Um, on the the data side, yeah, I, I mean, I would, I, I think you start with FCDOT and say, if, you know, this data is not readily available, um, you know, where where do we go or is it, it, how, how can we make, uh, how can we get this on a regular, on a regular basis? And then, um, yeah, and the last one on the, um, um, the, I guess was, that was more on the, Pedestrian and bicycle interaction with vehicles, or what was, what was the last recommendation? That one's um, kind of on the lines of enforcement. Is you know if if there are these things happening, then how do we get the data to be able to say it was on this kind of road or was on that kind of road? It was you know these kinds of lighting conditions. It was that kind of you know that to try and figure out all these variables so that. Um, so that they can make better decisions about design and and actually enforcement. I think our police need to be informed of of um, I, I think our police need to be informed that it's not always the pedestrian or the cyclist's fault. 
No, I, I mean, absolutely. I, and I, I, you know, my situation is still playing out. I haven't even seen the police report yet. Uh, you know, I'm not looking for draconian steps on the driver, uh, especially since this was a, a low speed, but I, I, you know, I don't want, you know, the, I don't want the idea to be ignored because I think in a way he, you know, definitely was negligent. Traffic was only going one way and he was only looking, I believe, in the way the traffic was going and not accounting for pedestrian or bicycle traffic coming in the other direction. So, um, you know, that, that is, that is important. Um, I, I would just say, you know, my gut reaction is I wouldn't have any problem endorsing these recommendations if the TAC uh, chooses to do so here at some point. Okay. And, and I would just add to that, that in light of Carla talking to us back in February, you know, every single one of these are equity issues. It's, it's almost as if we're speaking on behalf of those who are just trying to get to work and they're never going to have, they're going to rarely have the opportunity or the ability to speak on their own behalf. And so, you know, pedestrians and utility cyclists are disproportionately represented among the working poor. And we need to make sure that their interest is protected. Yeah, I think the other interesting thing here, at least that I gathered, was that you're you're not taking away from somebody. You're not saying like, I want a wider bike lane here, and therefore you're going to take away pavement from the motorist. You're just saying, you know, looking at what we have here and and making sure that uh, that we keep that that it's like the, the trail isn't blocked for a project that you get. Uh, you get the data that is out there probably somewhere that we don't have uh, so that you can do better analysis. So I think that helps you guys because I don't see you threatening anybody here. Oh, just trying to find out information. Well, well done. Thank you. Well, I think most of these uh, project managers will adhere to the regulations as written, but if they're not written into the regulations, they probably won't do it. So you're going to have to have some kind of rules so that there are detours or cones or some workaround for projects that disrupt a pedestrian or, or cyclist path and accommodate that the same way as you would they would if they narrow you down to one lane on a motorway. They do that a lot around here. I don't see where this would be a big problem, but it probably would be, but they still probably ought to do it. I'm thinking along Route 7, one of these days we're probably going to improve that. And the pedestrians do use that to get to and from buses and stores and whatnot. And that is about as pedestrian unfriendly a place as there is. I wouldn't want to walk on it. So. Um, this is Mary Pauline. Kelly, on your point in terms of uh, the issues with Comstock and um, bikes that have been left and the lack of clarification in terms of the locks being snapped and then taken away, my only thought on that might be to add that while I, I definitely agree that those developers are a problem that I have a number of cycling friends that seem to have had issues, not just on developer property, but on county properties as well, that if, you know, they left a bike overnight because bad weather hit and they didn't feel comfortable riding anymore, that they've had that same issue, even though it wasn't on a developer property. So maybe that would be a question in addition to that for the county as a whole. Oh, wow, that's interesting. I'd not heard that. So, yeah. Well, I mean, and, and there's a question as to, this. as to town versus, but um, I, I'm not, a lot of people use the name of Herndon, and there's a lot of confusion as to whether they say something is Herndon, whether it's truly in the town or whether it's that mailing address of Herndon. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure of the exact locations or of where some of these things, but through some of my people that I talk to, the gather at the green lizard um it's been told about issues they've had that don't ever leave your bike um overnight anywhere that it will be um taken not just through theft but that you're not allowed to leave it overnight anywhere and i i certainly understand that we aren't supposed to leave uh, a bike 
in storage for you know a week at some location but the idea that it couldn't be left overnight does seem to be problematic it's a great point and i think the issues of of bike parking really are specifically could be addressed in the act of fairfax um, some of these other issues you know might lean into other policy areas but the bike you know bike parking really isn't um, addressed or enforced in a lot of these spaces. Um, the county has a lot of leverage, I think, in the, um, you know, in the land use phase of development when they're trying to get approval and they make all these promises. Yes, we're going to do X, Y, Z. It's going to be great. But when it comes to when it's built, it doesn't, you know, there's no way, it doesn't really seem like there's any levers the county has to enforce or to follow up or to go back to other properties who weren't subject to guidelines when they were built 30 years ago or 50 years ago. Um, you know, and, and it's not just public private spaces like Mary Pauline was saying, it's county spaces too. I mean, I, um, I rode my bike to the South County Government Center earlier this week to get my vaccine and um, the bike parking there is not um, wheel accessible. It's in a patch of grass that was muddy because it had been raining <laughs> it's not covered, it's not protected, and this is a county facility, you know, this is where we should be um, showcasing, you know, the best of our policies. Um, so, yeah, I think, so, yeah, that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, the bike parking, I think, should be directly um, addressed by active Fairfax. You know, I've forgotten about the bikes in your presentation. Is there... When I drive to Arlington retail establishments, I'm in total fear of where I park because they are very, very aggressive uh, in towing out of lots if, uh, if they don't, you know, allow uh, uh, public parking. But I, I never knew this was an issue for bicycles. Um, did you hazard to guess what the what the rationale is by the developer? What why they're being uh, uh, so heavy on the enforcement? Are they are you taking away bicycle spaces from their staff? No, so, um, this particular one, they have three bicycle racks in front of their apartment building that's right there, but they say those are for the residents <laughs> and that the um, people who are not residents can use the parking that's downstairs. It's provided by the county. Um, and, and the issue here is that there was no signage. So when you say that you're fearful when you drive to Arlington, so am I, or into D.C., I'm like, I know I'm going to park in the wrong place. I'm going to come back here. My car will be gone. Um, right. But I but at least there's a sign that says you can't park here and there isn't anything like this on the plaza that says you know you can't park here unless you are this person um yeah and and i and i was actually eating at a restaurant there on the plaza so am i likely to go back there and put any more money into the restaurant probably not so it's one of those things, though, that I, I agree with Alexis that it naturally folds into the active Fairfax plan and by putting it in there and by supporting them, it gives it more teeth and gives them more heft when they're talking with developers about what real bike parking actually is. So it's twofold, though, you're you're it, at a minimum, you, you need the signage and that seems like I a no brainer, but the secondly, you also out of Active Fairfax would like the developers to provide public bike parking. Right. Well, and, and okay. here's the thing is that that not only I mean, just like um, I can't remember who it was that said that maybe it was you um, that when you have a project manager and the project manager knows that if I'm going to do this, then I have to detour it and sign it a certain way, then the project manager is very comfortable because he or she knows what the rules are and can follow the rules. Now, I, on the other hand, as a user, may not like the way it's implemented, but there's a set of rules and the rules have been complied with. With bike parking, it's anybody's best guess as to what those rules are. And I think that would be helpful to them for us to press them on making the rules clearer. Well, so yeah. Signage that you've talked about. Yeah, at a yeah. minimum. Yeah, I would agree. The signage, the signage is a no-brainer. The 
the access, I think it seems to me that's something they have to get in the proffers, and if they haven't if they haven't provided that, getting it after the fact might be uh, more difficult. Yeah. yeah. But I, I don't think you can provide it for one class of people and not the other in a public private space because there is a public easement for use of the restaurants and the plaza itself. I mean, they want people to come there and spend money. They want people to come there and watch their movies. Then, you know, don't make two classes of people. But. Yeah, you would hope that some common sense would prevail there. Um, you would hope. <laughs> but not always. <laughs> Um, I had a okay. couple comments. Um, yes, yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Kelly and Alexis, uh, for putting this together. It's great. Um, so I, we had, I had some experience on the crash data side. So there, so the VDOT does have a map where they have all the crash information. You can sort it in a lot of different ways. I think to your point, it's not complete because it does. It does not include, I think you have to hit a certain threshold for uh, property damage in order to get there. Um, so I, I, I think at some point it's a combination of VDOT information and and a separate database that's held by the police department, which I don't think is um, as accessible, but I, I could be wrong, but I'd be interested in understanding where that data is. Um, so I had included um some additional items and i th i think they can you know we're talking about enforcement of existing laws that's what kind of triggered my thoughts around it and whether there's opportunities to if we're asking about how new laws are enforced i did hear um there was a community meeting on blake lane on the accident on blake lane with a bicycle and it sounds like the the driver was charged with the with that new law and so that's how it was used in that case it was obviously after the incident um when there was an accident um but i i would be interested in how they're doing that proactively along with those other laws and then just generally about kind of what format this takes i i would support just not having to funnel it into a, a particular program, I, I, th I think we can package these all together and send them off to the board of supervisors if there's support for them. I, we could suggest including it into Active Fairfax too. I just don't know. That seems like a long process and we have, you know, providing advice to the board of supervisors. If I, you know, I think we can just provide it directly to the board of supervisors. And I appreciate that because that's not something I I, I just don't understand how the process works when we come up with, hey, I've got a great idea where it goes from there. So I appreciate whatever guidance you all can give me on that. I think we're all figuring it out together. <laughs> yes, that is true. Um, Jeremy, is that it? Yeah, question? Nope. Uh, that's all oh, right. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, that last point you made about yielding to pedestrians right away. They do that pretty much in Arlington. And you do have to be careful when you're driving in Arlington to yield to pedestrians in the, who aren't even in the crosswalk. And I've seen people do that. It is a change of culture. Uh, 20 years ago, I was working in Romania. And the law in Romania is that if you see a pedestrian at the edge of the crosswalk, you darn well better stop. Uh, and I've seen people get ticketed for that. Uh, I've been in Romania about 24 hours and I was going across the street with my translator. Uh, this was a two by two, speed was probably about 35 miles an hour. And the first driver stopped. The driver behind him did not stop. Plowed into the car in front of it and knocked it into the intersection. And I said, I was, I was just uncomfortable with this idea of stepping out into traffic. And my translator said, I've lived in Romania all my life and I've never seen this. And I said, well, I've been in Romania 24 hours and I've seen enough. I'm not sure that's going to solve. It's going to be a change in culture. Which, uh, and as, other than that experience, I was, by the end of two weeks, I was getting used to walking out into the street, into the walkway and cars would stop. 
but you know you're, you're betting your bob if they don't okay. otherwise i thought it was a pretty good idea but it is it's a little risky mm -hmm. particularly here maybe in romania it isn't but it is here mm -hmm. okay um appreciate that roger um do we have other commissioners with uh, questions or, uh, or comments? I've, I've got one. Yes. Um, it's thanks for the work. It's uh, really interesting. I hadn't thought about this particular issue, especially on the blocking uh, and getting access to get around uh, on, on the sidewalks. But the, to me, the, all of this is important, but the biggest issue to me when it comes to sidewalks and bike trails and everything else is, is we're not talking about it all. And that is, uh, we've all, I've heard it about four commissioners say, I don't want to walk down this road because you'll die. Uh, Richmond Highway basically is the same way. Uh, there's some sidewalks, then there's not. There's some sidewalks and then they're not. Um, so even with if we get most of this done in active Fairfax, which is great, we still don't have the sidewalks or, or the trails that we need built. Um, so I would I would say that we need to maybe uh, do something with the state for funding for these trails, you know, because without the money, uh, frankly, it'll be a a patchwork of fixes. You may get Dominion to say, yeah, I'll do it. You may get uh, some gas station to say, I'll do it. But uh, we're still going to have a patchwork of trails and sidewalks that really don't provide anybody a good way of, to get around. So that's my comment. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Well, Pete. I'm going to, I'm going to chime in here on this kind of tangentially, and that is one of my pet peeves. And one of my pet peeves is free parking. And I'm going to single out cyclists for this because it's true with automobiles. But I see absolutely no sense on Mount Vernon Avenue in Alexandria that the parking there is along the street is free. That should be paid for. And I would argue that for cyclists, that bike racks should be paid for as well, much like a parking meter. Put your bike in there, drop in your coin, and it locks your bike in place. If the law enforcement comes along and finds that your time's expired, he or she can take your bicycle. Uh, it's a resource, just like parking, and we shouldn't be giving it away. And I suspect, too, that if you take the funds from those parking meters, both automobiles and bicycles, and maybe even scooters, and invest it in the area, in other words, that provides for landscaping, provides for right of way, provides for bicycles it provides for automobile parking you'll get what you pay for but if you don't pay for it you're probably not going to get it or if you're going to get it you're not going to get the way you want it so i would argue that one of the things we should take a look at is parking the high price of free parking and that it should be paid for and of course i'm a pariah for that uh, probably both by motorists and by cyclists as well. But I don't see why the government should provide your parking for either your bicycle or your automobile or your scooter. You should pay for it. Okay, okay. Um, Roger's view on the matter is clear and it certainly makes sense. I understand where you're, where you're coming from. Um, does any other commissioners have some some comments? I was going to uh, uh, make some light on here. I just uh, quickly, uh, Pete. I wanted to clarify. I mean, anywhere we're doing road improvements on Richmond Highway, do we not also do pedestrian and bike improvements at the same time? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the the answer is yes. Uh, but at the same time, right now, um, there is no continuous path uh, up and down Richmond Highway on either side uh, at this time, and there might be in 10 years. Um, but frankly, and the way it's been traditionally done, if, if um, there's no sidewalk and someone wants to put in a 7-Eleven, then the 7-Eleven has to put in a sidewalk. But then right next door, there's 
uh, a vacant lot or a uh, business that was put in there 50 years ago and there's no sidewalk. So it, it's a hodgepodge going, you know, throughout throughout the whole area. It's getting better, but at the same time, it's uh, there, there's places on Michigan Highway right now that uh, are definitely not ADA compliant. Uh, you'll 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 be. I, I don't use a wheelchair, but if I did, I'd be kind of upset at some of the spots because they put a telephone pole right in the middle of the sidewalk. Um, so I mean, it, this hit and miss. It, it's it's not good um, and not continuous. It's better than it was just the last couple of years, but still not close. Yeah, I, I would think that the Mount Vernon supervisor would be especially uh, cognizant of that and be uh, be keeping an eye on that. Oh, it, it, he is, and uh, the Mount Vernon Council Transportation we're on it too. Uh, the bike uh, people over there are, are all of us are, but um, Roy, it, it's it's a work in progress, and it, it's going to take probably twenty years to get something truly fixed, right? But if we treated our sidewalks like we did our roads, and that is with state funding and such, um, we could get a lot done. But right now, it's not that way. It's uh, I'll touch on a different issue, but it's the same sort of thing. But we've been wanting to get underground utilities, and part of it is to make the bike trails and the trees and all better. But the only way we can get that done at this point is the 7-Eleven will put it under the place next door. No, so you have it. You'll be having it above and under. It's the same sort of stuff with sidewalks, and it's kind of like uh, the issue that we were talking about here with uh, information. You got to jump through many different hoops to get any solid information when it goes uh, goes across uh, jurisdictions and um, responsibilities. And it's it's no different. Um. It, absolutely. Um, one thing I would suggest, though, is that uh, um, not surprisingly, we we were getting into a little wider areas. It makes sense because they all connect and and sort yes. of like a trail. You follow it, and you end up in different places. Yes. Um, but I think one of the th I think it's important for this conversation to come back to what Kelly and, and yep. Alexis had suggested, but also, and I know, and and and, and this is a great example, Pete. I think of. You know other areas we want to focus on, and that's sort of back to the uh, you know our work plan, where we yep. focus on what we want to do with sidewalks, etc. There's definitely a piece there, a big piece there for the uh, uh, the supervisor themselves um, and their uh, uh, and their their transportation staff. Um, you know for individual projects, and and uh, I did talk about this with Jeff uh, when I first came on here. Uh, as Supervisor Faust told me, "I'll take care of the uh, the projects. You sort of take care of the policy." Um, and that's kind of the way I think it sort of works out, but, but there's always a, a dividing line. Um, but if I could, um, acknowledging the, the importance of that piece, come back to, uh, Kelly and Alexis's brief, um, excellent, <laughs> of, of course, happy to, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> excellent work. And, um, I think that, uh, um, uh, Jeremy, your point about, and, and Kelly, you're asking a question too, both before the preparation here this evening, sort of how we proceed. Um, we could go to the board of supervisors with anything we want. Um, and so, for instance, we could, uh, uh put a little bow on the brief here and say the board, we think you should do this. But one of the 1st questions is going to be, well, how and where and what policies you need, need, need to change. And who's with you and who's against you? Um, and so I think that uh, um, we have an opportunity here to build a bit of a coalition, which also helps us understand a bit more about what might be more achievable, what might make sense, what's actually going on. And Kelly, a big part of your your, your brief here, and, and Alexis, as you were talking about it, you know, finding more information on, on a lot of areas. Um, and I think we can absolutely uh, send this brief to the active Fairfax folks and ask them to have a look at it. Um, you know, I want to be careful a little bit, you know, manage our expectations a bit. You know, they've asked to come speak to us for their report to the board. Um, and I welcome that and we, and we, we know that's something we absolutely want to do. I don't want to uh, distract them too much with stuff that's, that's, you know, they, they don't need, but we don't notice what they need. And some of the stuff we, the stuff we got here is actually important. It makes sense. Um, and so I think the first stop, but honestly, is 
you know, active Fairfax with these and let them tell us how they see it fits in. Maybe they've addressed some of these sort of things. It is possible. The signage seems pretty obvious. <laughs> um, it could be something they've thought about already. Um, if not, it could be something they welcome easily. If not, then how come? You know, what is it about it that seemed obvious to us when we're talking about here, but maybe in actuality is not so obvious. Um, and I think, again, having Active Fairfax come here on, on May the 4th is a, a perfect opportunity to, you know, for us to do that. Another a piece I think we ought to uh, touch on in talking about safety in a lot of areas is Vision Zero. Um, what's going on with the Vision Zero plan? What's the strategy? Because the streets where there is a lot of accidents, I would think the Vision Zero folks should be looking at that as well, too. Um, what's their relationship with Active Fairfax? I don't know. Um, but we could we could find it out. I don't want to go too far because I don't want to. I use the word hijack. <laughs> you know the uh, um, the active Fairfax when they come on May the fourth. Um, but it's not inconceivable that it might make sense to have some uh, uh, Vision Zero folks there as well. Um, we can lay a little bit of groundwork between here and there. And, and now we're limited by the uh, enthusiasm and energy level and and exceptional things like that. And uh, again, thank you again, Kelly Alexis, for for doing this. But it's it, it would be um, easy necessarily um, to have some of the air, you talk to the active Fairfax folks about some of these things and and, and learn a bit more about where they where they're coming from. Or we just have them come on on the fourth of May and ask them to respond to a brief. We can do it. You know, we can do it either way. Um, you know, one of the uh, 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 you know as we're looking at the uh, the construction projects there, and yes, we talked about the signage being pretty obvious. But there's going to be some regulation somewhere. Let's find it. Does the active Fairfax folks know where these regulations are? If not, do you have to go to county attorney? We can go to the county attorney. It'll take a little while, maybe to get an answer. It's okay. We'll be uh, uh, patient, but we're not going to let them dawdle forever. Um, a month or two to to look up some things, you know. However, whatever our timeline is, I think we can. I think we can do those sort of things. Um, you know the uh, 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 the uh, uh, stuff with the uh, um, data on the roads and things like that. Uh, if VDOT has data, you know we can we can ask for that kind of stuff. And and here is where um, you know uh, Cal would help us navigate the uh, FC dot a little bit, find where some things are and stuff like that. Um, to me, I think at, you know starting with Active Fairfax is good for a variety of reasons, and not just because Kelly and Alexis timed the brief that way, but they title it that way for a reason. Uh, there's an excess there, um, and let's start there and, and see see how far we can go. Um, you know, and so uh, I would like us to be able to get a bit more data, um, and not that we just sit around and ask a lot of questions and spend months and months doing this, but I think that it will strengthen our uh, uh, our ability to decide what we think needs to happen, and and ultimately strengthen the ability to make a recommendation to the board that it can act upon right away. You know, imagine us making a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors on something related to Active Fairfax. The Active Fairfax folks and the Vision Zero folks are both giving a thumbs up going, that's, you know, we think that's great. And maybe it doesn't even have to go that far. Maybe the Active Fairfax folks can or already have put in their plan, in which case we go, cool, it's there, we've done our part. Um, so, I mean, I think there's a few ways that we can, we can sort of do that. Um, uh, Jeremy, I see your picture there. Does that mean you want to talk or you just happen to have your camera on? Well, I, yeah, so I agree with everything you said. I think my only concern is I, I'm under the impression and we can be. My impression can change in on the 4th, but that active Fairfax is a very long process and. I, and it sounds like policy is on the back side of that. Process, okay. and so some of these things seem like big issues that we don't want to wait years to try to address and so. I guess that's my point. We just need to be aware of how long this process is going to take and how, uh, where we want to insert it into the discussion. Okay. Um, Mike, that's actually, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, I hate uh, navel gazing and and long processes. I, I'm a big fan of, of things we could maybe accomplish in the short term, and I just think. What Kelly and uh, Alexis have got here, this is pretty well written. It's narrow and it's not threatening anybody. Um, is there, would we be sending it to, I mean, is Active Fairfax solely contained within FCDOT? It's not, right? I, my point was, I thought, couldn't we 
send this on to somebody in FC DOT and say, you know, we're, we're also going to be querying uh, active Fairfax uh, maybe at the next working session. But what does FC DOT think of these? Do you have any problems with these or would you like to add something? So but that was kind of my suggestion. I think that's brilliant. Okay. And yeah, because then uh, Tom Bashadney or whoever can say, you know, this part of this isn't us, but it's these folks over here, and I'm going to connect them with you so you can get the answers you're looking for. Because he's the guy that knows everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Never sleeps. Yes. Exactly. That's right. That's right. Yeah, because, because I agree with Jeremy that Active Fairfax has been a long term, you know, kind of engineering solution that's laying plans for the 22nd century and all that. <laughs> um, and 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 that's fine because there may be parts of this that make them go, oh, wait, we can tighten this up a little bit or we can look at that a little bit differently. And so I think but but because they're contained within FCDOT, if if we send it to Tom, then he has the opportunity to say to the folks that work for him on that program or anything else, hey, take another look at this. That's great. We've done our job. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and uh, I'm also not sure if Active Fairfax is a wholly owned piece of FC DOT or whether there's other, other components there. Certainly a big part of it is, I, I know. Um, so absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, I think that's a good habit to get in for anything we want to do. And I think it is what we do. We'd like to know what FC DOT thinks before you know charge off and do something. Um, there's, there's rarely a topic. I'll, I'll be surprised if there's a topic we find they've never thought of. <laughs> they might not be able to spend much time on it, but they'll tell us that. Um, they'll tell us where they are and what they're thinking about and what some of their thoughts are. Um, and most importantly, it allows us to try and figure out how we can help. Um, maybe it's something that isn't right for some reason. Okay, we move on to something else. Maybe our involvement can help push the ball over the goal line. And actually, back to your point, Jeremy, about uh, Active Fairfax. Absolutely understand uh, that it uh, you know can be a lengthy process. So when the board of supervisors asks us for a recommendation, well, you know, is it in the active Fairfax plan? Yes or no. But also, it's easy for us to say um, we think this is important to act on now because the active Fairfax plan will take two years for it to come to fruition. We think this needs to go forward now, um, and the active Fairfax folks will know about this beforehand, so we won't be short seating them. Um, and making it look like they're not doing things in a board away. They'll, they'll, you know, and maybe they'll do things a bit more quickly than that, you know, and something we think ought to be done a bit more quickly. Um, but I think that um, certainly in the beginning stages, um, making sure we don't go, you know, allow ourselves to delve just into navel gazing, understanding what's going on, gathering the data, um, gathering the information, understanding what's happening with each of the various groups. That then allows us to make a determination as to is not just the content, although that's very important, but the strategy, how we want to make this change. Um, and we can decide for timing or other reasons to, to partner right up with, you know, uh, um, Active Fairfax, or we can say, well, we're really close on the substance, but you guys are just taking too long. Uh, so we're going to go forward, but but they know it then. And I think all those sort of things we can work as we go forward as we get the data, uh, as we get the information, as we draw these connections here. And this is another good thing, at, uh, Kelly and Alexis, about what you've done is this is this is a manageable piece. This is not that big, and it's important. It's it's worthwhile, um, and I think it's something that we can we can uh, you know dive into, come to some conclusions on, and and I think make some recommendations relatively quickly. Could I be so bold that we could move this tonight under the chairman's signature to Tom? Um, I, I don't think we need for me to sign it, although I'm not opposed well, to doing it. I, what, just your what, what, approval. What, well, we certainly, um, and, and I think if we could, um, don't move it yet because I, I'm thinking about the processes. I absolutely want to get this to FC dot and want to make sure that the active fair folks have a look at it and also put on to the vision zero folks as well. Um, you know, Alan, we could, you know, ask Tom to do that. Um, we, I don't think we need a motion to do this. I can do that uh, based upon the, uh, uh, the, the, the feelings of the TAC. Um, move or, as a general term. So whatever way okay. gets it to FC DOT, I'm fine with. Okay. Okay. No, I yeah. absolutely agree with that, Kevin. Yes. I, I think that makes sense. And I think I don't know that we need an official movement because we're asking them for feedback of issues that we're interested in that we're talking about. The only thing I would add um, out of the, the four pieces that I had put, I think the one that makes the most sense 
here is to, uh, if we're asking about the enforcement of pedestrians is also the enforcement of uh, handheld devices. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe that's a, so th we're asking about how it's being enforced. Maybe it's also a question about data related to those new laws and how that's being collected. Okay. Jeremy, isn't that a, 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 isn't that superseded though by the new law on the handheld? So you, you can't have any. So that, isn't that fast and answered? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Is how is that being enforced? I, as my understanding, the police that's a, a a primary enforcement issue. If you have a cell phone or any handheld device, that's a, I believe a primary offense that they can pull you over. Yeah, but isn't it, so it's the same question about stopping for pedestrians, right? So my thought would be um, pedestrians is, and someone can correct me if I'm off on this, but is more a regional issue, whereas the cell phones is a state law now. And so I feel like we'd have two different groups collecting they're both, the they're both data. State laws. They're both state yes. laws. Okay, well then I, I thought how the pedestrian was done was different from region to region. Okay. You know, and Jeremy, uh, I know from our communication before the meeting, uh, you know, talking about the, the police there, because, you know, these definitely, uh, now the, the 50 mile an hour speed limit, I think is, is, is a policy choice. And we talked a bit about that previously, about how we can actually make those kind of changes. And the law now allows communities to try and lower their speed limits to 15. But the other appear to be, you know, actual enforcement issues there, which to me is a little bit different than the kinds of things we ought to be enforcing because these are already laws to to, to deal to deal with them. This might be um, this might be something we want to ask the police about. You know, what their what their strategies are. I mean, what is it your what is it you'd like to get on these issues as you as you ask the question? Well, I, I think it's the same. It's the same question about the pedestrians. I'm not sure why we're separating the two because they're both enforcement okay. issues. And so there's a question about like how it's being enforced. Is it is it just after the fact? Are they have a strategy? Is there any kind of uh, more like it does? Does the county have a, a plan to promote this sort of thing? Do they, what's the messaging around it? I, I don't know what it is, but. Whatever the answer is, I'm interested in understanding. Um, I wonder if if Alexi, Alexis and and Kelly would take your number two and three there as a friend of the court, so the what so to speak, and add that in. Uh, well, I think three is it out. Yeah, three is already in there. I think that's. I think we're okay, talking about then, the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Then would they have any objections to adding number two? That still keeps it a very narrow uh, questions to FCDOT. No objection, and it's funny that you're asking because I almost made another slide and called it Jeremy <laughs> to add on to the end because I thought that his questions um, and his his concerns really dovetailed very well into this. Um, mm -hmm. I I also am very interested in how they're enforcing it because I can tell you when they did the three foot passing law, there was a lot of messaging, but it wasn't until right before it became effective. And if in July, people are no longer going to be able to drive around with their phone in their hand, they need to be hearing about that now and not just in June. Um, because, you know, I'm on the bike and I'm next to cars and traffic all the time. It's more often than I like that people are driving with the phone in their hand. A lot of times they're driving big landscape trucks with trailers. And holding a soda in the other hand, I mean, it's just this craziness that you need to be getting that word out. You need to be getting it out in multiple languages and you need to be getting it out, telling people exactly what's going to happen. How are they going to enforce it? So I think it's important to ask that and it, and it may even be that that's. That's its own inquiry that goes to FCPD, but I would love to have Tom say this is scpd let's push it over there rather than us going straight to them right easily done i think you know i think we can certainly ask about uh, uh you know the vision zero piece there and also to let us know uh you know to uh, you know talk talk us talk to us about areas where it is you know where it is an fcpd issue um, so we can understand what, what where things where the lines are drawn well, here in Fairfax County, I don't think we have 
the authority to set our speed limits like uh, some of the towns and cities do. That would make our life easier. Um, because again, in Alexandria and Arlington and Falls Church City, they do. And they have lowered their speed limits. There's many parts where it's 25 miles an hour or 30. And they don't mean 26 or 31. But we just don't have the authority to do that. Yeah, the 15, the 15 mile that. an hour is part of the new, is a new law. So I think it was just signed. So it's only related yeah. to um, residential and business districts. Mm -hmm. But I, I understand there's still a lot of policy to be drafted around it. So I think it's probably early for that. Yeah. Again, yeah, like that if law, if it's to 15 miles an hour in any residential street. Yeah, it's up to the the, the jurisdiction. Yeah. The, the community. Yeah, well, there's some things standard. some things you have to do, but yes. Yeah. Again, Mike, you know, 945 or whatever. Yeah. I think uh, if you incorporate Jerry's number, Jeremy's number two and three, uh, what, uh, what, what Kelly and Alexis got in some format, you can get this out of here tonight and check it off. Well, I don't know about tonight, but what I was going to suggest, actually, if, uh, if, if Kelly and uh, uh, Jeremy would be willing to, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kelly, if you'd be able to willing to take a stab to put in uh, number two, because I think you say number three is in there, um, okay. you have to have a look at it, and then give me the brief, you know, revised. That, that's all we need. I mean, this is a good enough brief. I can send it for as it is. What I'll do then is I will uh, uh, send it to Tom, um, ask FCDAP for comments, and ask specifically to you know, make sure the Act of Fairfax have a look at it, Division Zero folks, and also let us know about potential connections to FCPD, um, and also say that we'd like to be able to discuss the Act of Fairfax when they come on May the 4th, although we recognize the priority of the meeting is their, uh, uh, their prep for the board. So we're not going to elbow our way to the front of what they need to do, but we would like to incorporate and get, get some views there. Are there any objections from anybody to doing that tonight? I mean, I, when you no, I'm happy to do that. I just want to make sure that Jeremy's number two is the number two that was in the email. Oh, enforcement of handheld. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And three is the enforcement of stopping for pedestrians, which, as you say, you really sort of covered. Okay. And okay. was there anything else, Jeremy? No, I think that's it. Okay. Yep, I can do that. Well, Great work. Fantastic. Okay, I think we have a, a, a plan of action here. So uh, that's very good. Um, I tell you what, let's let's keep moving here. It's it's, it's getting late, as Kevin Sarandon points out. Um, we're going to go to the uh, the other business and announcements, the work session on May the fourth. We really have talked about that. Um, you know, in terms of how we want to, uh, uh, you know, we're happy to to host. Uh, we look forward to talking with them. We'll ask questions about the central questions and, and we'll talk to them there. There may be some prep communications beforehand. I can, I can handle those. And if need be, uh, we can call on, you know, Kelly, Kelly and Alexis and maybe even Jeremy and Nathan can have a conversation, but I don't think we need that for the, for the fourth. Just I think um, a question on scheduling. Yes, you had yes. mentioned that the, so the May 4th, that would have to be a work group. Does Special. that mean was, that we still have need to have a commission meeting in May? Uh, or is that, that would be the idea. Yeah, the, these are, this is a, this is a voluntary, uh, a voluntary thing. Um, and, uh, I will admit, I had the opportunity to at least ask, uh, uh, Alexis and, uh, and Kelly and, uh, Mary Pauline, if they'd be able to participate on the board and they were able to, there's no obligation for any commissioner to, to, to do it. Um, and I wouldn't have suggested it except Tom specifically asked for it because of the schedule for active Fairfax. And so that's why I agreed to do it. We can't move our, our normal meeting to that date. Well, what you're really asking is that the, I mean, yes, what you're asking is we not meet also on the 18th. Um, but what I can say, uh, you know, I, 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 we can talk about that on the, on the 4th for those who are there and we can talk about it now. Certainly, um, you know, what I prefer to do is perhaps have a, a lighter agenda on the 18th. Um, I'm not, uh, uh, opposed to, to making the May meeting May the 4th. Um, you know, we're trying to do a few things, but also I don't want to uh, overload us there. What do folks think? Uh, Jeremy, you've raised the question, uh, but well, I was first. more thinking about whether we needed to meet twice in May or whether I we just... I know exactly what you're, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I know. I, I know. I, 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 I have a legitimate question. 
<laughs> the first the so, Tuesdays are, not, are just not good for me. Uh, I mean, I've, I've got other meetings. So I would have preferred to do this to, to see whatever was on the agenda the 18th and do it mm -hmm. then. But your Tom says we don't have time, right? Right. So. They need to have something from us if we're going to do something in time for the 25th. And that's not the first time they can see us. What we can do, though, is we can have the conversation with them on the 4th. If we meet on the 18th, we could pass the resolution then on the 18th and then be ready for the 25th. We could do that. You know, that works uh, if you if you can, you know, and, and in doing that, those of you who are, are uh, generous enough to attend on the 4th and can. You know, then make the that part of the agenda on the 18th, you know, that much less time and all, all yeah. better. Yeah, I mean, I don't think any of us likes necessarily having to give up extra time. Um, having said that, um, when I, I can't speak for everyone, but I know when I specifically accepted the role on this committee, um, it was actually stated that we were expected to do work sessions once a month in addition to the meetings. And we haven't done those um, really during COVID, but prior to COVID, we were having these work sessions quite frequently. So, I mean, I guess I just kind of look at it as as long as we're getting things accomplished, it was one of the things I agreed to when I accepted this role. Well, once upon a time, many, many, many years ago, <laughs> the TAC did meet twice a month. That was what was expected. All uh, right. So we've gone to this once a month stuff uh, with the work session. And there are just sometimes when the things we want to accomplish require more than one meeting a month. And uh, I'll just go with the flow. If that's what we do, that's what we do. And if there's some month where you can't make it, well, you can't make it. But, you know, I, I may not be here for the 18th. I'm not sure yet. Uh -huh. I certainly will be. So, uh, the cat can function without me. They can't do it, but sure. It won't be the same, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> well, my two cents is uh, I'll try to make both. Um, at the same time, the uh, way I understand it is we're supposed to be here on the 18th, and that's our required date. The, the other date is not required. Um, it's what's suggested, and if you can make it, you make it. If you can't make it, you can't. But at the same time, the tech can still have a work session. And so I'm on board. Well, I also can assure folks, um, there's only one topic on the May 4th agenda. Uh, I'm not going to double up, I swear to God. <laughs> We're not going to do two things on the 4th. We would only do the, uh, uh, the you know, the, the active Fairfax plan, you know, the associated conversation. Um, and if there's some essential things we need to talk about, you know, um, uh, like the meeting minutes, maybe. I think maybe, okay, although I don't want to get, we had a long conversation about the minutes this time, but understandable why. Um, but that's 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 the only thing I would do. And then we get back to the 18th for, uh, for regular order there. Um, and again, I think in, in this situation, it was because of uh, Tom's ask, um, you know, and, but this is always a balance. Um, and I know that uh, um, most of the folks here were able to, uh, to, to be at the offsite, which was six hours on a Saturday. Um, so, you know, we've been asking more and uh, it's been very gratifying to see commissioners wanting to do more, but we want to balance. So, but honestly, if for whatever reason you're not able to make it, Something happens, you know, the, the tree falls on the house, and you gotta deal with that, or you just, you know, just can't do it. It's okay. You know, and 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 the way we're trying to structure these conversations is if you miss a meeting, you can catch up. You know, it's not like uh, uh you, you you miss a meeting and like all of a sudden we did a bunch of stuff and nobody knew what was going on. We're trying to, you know, what uh you know what uh, uh, you know telegraph the stuff too. So um so we'll have a meeting on the fourth. Go ahead. I was just going to say, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but this is not a meeting. Obviously, we check to heat, see who is attending at the start, but I don't believe this counts in terms of your numbers of meetings attended um, or missed, however you want to label that. What's We didn't need to have a quorum to have a work session. So yes, people missing out is not going to um, hinder the ability to still have a discussion. And absolutely. And, and I think picking up on that point, um, yes, we'd like people to as many meetings as possible. Um, if you're not there yet, you sort of notice it, but most people are, most people are here. 
but certainly um, in my view is if you're not able to come uh, to the offsite, not able to come on the fourth, it's okay. It, it, it's, it, it is okay. Uh, I know there's there's a, there's a tension there, but uh, yeah, I think my, my comment was more not that I didn't want to attend a meeting is yeah. that I didn't want to attend a meeting just for the sake of a meeting. And so as long as we have things to do and talk about, that's um, that's fine with me. We haven't got to the main meeting agenda yet on the on the topic here, so uh, we'll see if we can entice you with a, a good topic. <laughs> so, okay, um, Mike. Yes, um, Mr. Calvin. It is, it is still a public meeting and we still have to advertise it and we have to still take note and process online. So it, I mean, it's the same as our regular meeting, but the attendance is not required. So that, that's the only thing different, but we still have to do right. everything else. Same, yeah. Oh yeah, note takers and the whole thing. So yes. Yeah. So yeah, if you don't want to take notes, don't come to the meeting. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, okay. Um, all right, well, there's, there's the active Fairfax. I did want to uh, uh, raise a, a couple uh, quick issues um, related to active Fairfax. Um, and this is, I've got next item on the agenda here is sort of participation in, in working groups, um, but there's also um, sort of opportunities there. Active Fairfax meetings uh, have been going on for a little while. There's about uh, five or six that have yet to be, uh, yet to take place. Um, I think we'd pass this on to the TAC members, uh, Calvin, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the, uh, 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 there's one tomorrow, Sully District, and then Mount Vernon on the 22nd, uh, Braddock on the 26th, Springfield 27th, Providence 28th, uh, and then there's a lunch and learn on April 23rd. Um, just FYI, um, we'll get a chance to see the active Fairfax folks. It'd be nice to sort of let the community know about stuff like that, but, um, that's that's tough for us to do, um, given our current situation. The drains of the meeting was tonight, so I wasn't able to attend. So, um, the other thing I'll mention, another thing I'll mention here is, and actually to the uh, uh, to the working groups, um, Tom mentioned a, a couple when I talked to him. Um, uh, one, there is a a group that's being uh, set up. Uh, could be a fairly large group. Uh, they are casting a fairly wide net for uh, potential participants. It's a working group to uh, uh, rename uh, uh, Lee Jackson Highway, uh, Route 29 and Route 50. And so what they're thinking about is, you know, maybe having like uh, 50 nominees for which they choose 25 or something like that. It looks like it's going to be a, a, a large group. If there's any commissioners that want to participate in that, uh, please, uh, you know, let, uh, uh, let me know, let Calvin know. Um, it's not a mandatory formation. Um, but, uh, but the opportunity is there if, if you'd like to try and participate, but as Tom said, when I talked to him, uh, just cause you sign up or want to do it, doesn't mean you're going to do it. They're, they're probably going to have like, uh, the project is going to pick uh, a number of folks to participate from the folks who volunteer to participate. Other thing, uh, the other, uh, uh, major group is, uh, uh, and, and Calvin sent something out here is a, is a climate group. Um, it's called the, uh, uh, it's like here. The uh, uh, TARP, the uh, um, infrastructure, wait a minute, here we go. I just had the title and now it's disappeared on me. Um, Climate Adaptation and Resilience Plan. So um, Calvin had sent out some uh, uh, invitations for this. Their first meeting is April 30th. Uh, Chair McKay would like to have somebody from the uh, TAC participate in this. Um, I would as well too, if, if possible. Um, I think there's opportunities to to stay connected. We can certainly look at some of the documents there, um, but it would be nice to uh, have somebody, even if they're not able to go to uh, 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 meetings uh, or all the meetings. I think there's going to be about three or four over the uh, uh, over the next year or so. Uh, so it's not a, a too too much work, um, but uh, uh, those are uh, uh, those are taking place over the next year or so. So again, if you have any any interest in that, please uh, please let me know. Um, I may need to assign somebody. Not that I can really assign because we're all volunteers. <laughs> um, but this one I might come back to because of the, the chairman's interest on this. So um, so hopefully this will uh, somebody have some interest here and can can uh, pick up and, and get involved in this. All right. Um, the. Uh, uh, Another thing here is the, uh, uh, let's see, 
Okay, that's the, uh, the the working groups there. Next is the agenda for the uh, the May TAC meeting. Um, and so we'll see if we can come up with something that will attract Jeremy's attention. I'm sorry, I shouldn't joke that way. Um, originally, I would say originally when I when I put the uh, uh, the agenda together prior to uh, the active Fairfax discussion, I uh, was thinking of having more bike and pedestrian discussions. Um, I don't want to just talk about bicycles and pedestrians. We certainly can if we want, but I think that uh, um, you know uh, we're 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 taking some good steps with the active Fairfax plan, um, and obviously the, the meeting on the fourth. Um, there is a, a a bike and pedestrian event the El Castillo is having on April twenty first. Um, uh, Calvin was kind enough to send that on as well, and uh, I encouraged folks to let folks know about that as well. Um, so please uh, let folks know about uh, uh, about that event as, as you see as you see fit. What I'm thinking about is um, maybe uh, uh, maybe in uh, uh, in May we can try and have that Uber Lyft and Via discussion we've been talking about for a while. Um, I know that's something that's uh, uh, that's of some interest, uh, and and not just to Kevin, but Kevin has mentioned a desire to to do that sooner rather than later. Um, and so I think that's something that uh, uh, I can try and uh, move forward on. Uh, I, I don't quite want to. Uh, I don't want to go with the board transportation aids just yet. Um, I'd like to get a little further along with the summer activities, um, but I think that might be a, a, another good topic. Um, and so the other thing, what we can do here um, is, uh, uh, depending on the schedules of things, and uh, um, what I can do here is, given our situation, rather than assume we're going to have a meeting on the 18th and say, you know, um, you know, we're just going to do it. Here's the agenda. I'm willing to uh, uh, send out a proposed agenda, you know, or talk about it <laughs> maybe on the fourth about what we do on May 18th, um, and then send it out to the commissioner so we can set up another one. Actually, the meeting on the 18th as well. What do folks think about the Uber Lyft Via thing? And Kevin, I see your picture there, so I think I know what you're going to say. But what are you going to say? Yeah, I, the sooner we get them in, the better. And, and feel free to invite uh, Elon Musk and ask him how the automated uh, vehicle. Uh, program is going there. Okay. I think you saw the uh, the headline on that one. So that'll be interesting to see where that uh, where the, the, it, I hope everyone is aware of that where there was a a very serious uh, uh, pile yes. up of the uh, and apparently nobody in the driver's seat. So yeah, yeah. And to older people too who should know better than to just sit in a car without anybody in the driver's seat. But... Yeah, you would yeah. you would think. Yes. But awesome. sooner the better, you know, that's that's uh, to me. I, I can't wait to get them in here. Okay. Okay. Um, any, any other uh, uh, topics that we think we should, uh, I don't want to just spend too much time on this, but if somebody has a topic that they think is important, they want to raise right now for consideration, um, or you can send it to me afterwards if you, if you prefer. Um, Mike, so yes. um, would you like to talk about the bylaws or? I don't want to get to that. That's next on the agenda. Oh, okay. Uh, just, just making sure we're uh, um, getting through the. Uh, um, actually, I didn't have it on the agenda. Sorry, but it is the thing. It is the uh, thing that's part of the chairman's report. I did talk to Tom about that. So, um, okay. Well, that's that's what we'll try and do for the uh, for the, the May uh, the May meeting there. Um, thank you, Calvin, for the for the uh, for the uh, the intro. Um, chairman's report. Just a, a couple of things. Um, we had uh, um, we we passed the bylaws back in June of last year before a number of commissioners joined us. Um, had sent the uh, uh, had sent them uh, the mouth review a while ago. Did I I, asked, I uh, wanted to hold them until after we had our uh, our, our uh, facilitated work session. Obviously, that's happened. Um, I was looking at them again uh, the other day, and there's certainly some changes we could conceivably make, but I don't think it's worth. You know, reopening the uh, the can of worms. I think the uh, the uh, there is some a little confusion, so to speak, on the electoral the election process. But I think we know it is we can sort of figure it out, and you know we can we can make it work. And the other is the uh, the courts uh, themselves and things like that. Um, you know, uh, we will need to have an election come in July after we're hopefully all reappointed or numbers are reappointed, and then we can you know get our officers back in place again. Uh, the way the, uh, uh, the, uh, the the bylaws are written is that we have the, uh, the, the the year's report done by February, and then the work plan done by March. But honestly, I was just thinking, stick them together, do them at once. Um, and you know, here's what we did last year. 
it was reported in next year. So our first report uh, would then be February of uh, 2022, which is uh, which fits well with uh, talking with the board of supervisors in, in October. So what I'm thinking here is, um, and Calvin, I will send you the the version because I did make I think I want to make sure we're using the uh, the right one because I made a slight tweak to one, uh, you know, from over last summer. I'll send the uh, uh, the bylaws to uh, to Calvin. Uh, we'll we'll send it out to the commissioners. Uh, give you until the end of the week to have a look at it. Um, no more. Um, and then what we'll do is uh, uh, we'll submit that through time for approval to the board of supervisors. Uh, unless there's any objections on the part of the commissioners to what I just described. Okay. Silence sounds like a sense. Um, so that's what we'll do. Um, so, Calvin, uh, I will send the uh, bylaws to you tonight before I turn off my computer. Um, and then, uh, uh, commissioners, uh, please, if you have any uh, uh, comments or questions, uh, get back to Calvin and I uh, by Friday. Um, in fact, uh, how about Friday morning? Today is yeah, Friday morning. That way, uh, Calvin can submit it to the board, uh, hopefully by the end of the week. Did you? I, yes. Are you going to resend out the bylaws? I don't know that I've seen them. Okay. Um, that's one reason to do it, just to be sure. Um, and we can allow a bit more time if you want to look at it. In fact, I tell you what, have a look at them. If you do want to look at them, if you want to talk about them, we can we can pause the process a little bit here. Um, but as you can tell, I'd rather just get forward if we can. But I want my folks to make sure we're comfortable. Okay. The uh, Let's see here. Um, a couple other things that actually I don't think are uh, worth mentioning. <laughs> Not at this time of night at 10 in the evening. So uh, uh, <clears throat> that's the uh, chair's report. So now on to uh, uh, commissioner updates. So let's go through the, through the list. And uh, let's start with uh, uh, Kevin. Two items. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet uh, Bob Cosgriff, uh, the trails representative from Braddock. Uh, we were looking at the uh, the new trail that they're putting in from um, uh, the Oak neighborhood and Burke Center down to the Burke Center VRE lot. And uh, uh, there were some real possible shortcomings that we brought to the attention of the Braddock district supervisor's office. Uh, but in meeting him, he talked about, you know, the commonality or common issues, the trails and, and the tack. And uh, uh, so, you know, I'm very grateful, you know, that I was able to tell him that we have Pete um, on the, you know, the, Commission and uh, on the committee, and um, he specifically mentioned, you know, Richmond Highway. And I, you know, I trust Pete will, if he didn't already at night, if there's anything that, you know, from the trail side that we, you know, need to be looking at, uh, that he'll bring that to our attention. Although I think he did a pretty good job of that tonight. Uh, but uh, just thank you, Pete, for, uh, for uh, liaisoning to that uh, committee. The second item uh, was Alexis, are you still on? I see a screen. Maybe she's muted. Um, maybe she one of you go. She was having audio issues earlier, so perhaps that's the issue. If you could, could you come back to me then, Mike, and then um, I did want to bring something up. Okay. Um, next, uh, uh, Kelly, Hunter Mill. Um, we have the tour to Hunter Mill on May 15th. Um, Walter Alcorn, Dan Stork, and Chairman McKay will be riding in the event. And it is now sold out except for the 20 spots that we have reserved for uh, some scholarship participants were trying to recruit. So there might be 20 more seats available if you want to ride it, but uh, you got to get your name on the wait list. Okay. Thank you. That's good. I, I heard about that. I'm glad it was happening. Okay. Anything else, Kelly? That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Roger. Anything for you? At this hour of the night, I'm going to pass. Although tomorrow night, I, I guess I will be attending a meeting uh, in the capacity for the MW Cog on 
transportation engineers an accessible streetscape design project, which sounds like it's right up our alley. Yeah. Um, yeah, please do let us know if anything comes out of it. Uh, sure. You've been on the street issue for a while there, so uh, yeah, please bring it back. Okay. Okay, next is uh, Pete. Pete Sinek. There you go. Uh, hopefully I'm unmuted. Um, a couple just interesting things to me. Uh, the National Park Service uh, uh, and the Mount Vernon District uh, Transportation Committee are working uh, in kind of a colluding sort of way to improve the safety on uh, the George Washington Memorial Parkway from 495 down to the traffic circle at George Washington's estate. It's been something that uh, five previous chairs uh, have tried to do, and it looks like it's actually going to happen. Uh, this year, it, uh, some that stretch of road is going to be subject to being put on a diet. So there's going to be a road diet uh, placed on the parkway with plans for circles and all sorts of stuff to, to calm that road over the next couple of years. Um, at this moment, the only thing that's truly confirmed is a bunch of striping, but it's a step. Um, and I find it exciting because it's been 20 years trying to get this done. Um, Congratulations. Uh, thank you. It's yeah, on the shoulders of many others. Um, so it, it's some of these projects take a long time, as you all know, and this is taking Indeed. That long, it isn't going to take long to get it finished because now the devil is in the details. Um, uh, Richmond Highway, I, if I didn't share with you, good folks, um, uh, FC dot and B dot are are conducting a study to reduce the speed from forty five to thirty five. Where's um, the Richmond, Richmond Highway? Highway. Oh, and again, same basic area from four ninety five down to Fort Belvoir. Um, that that now has been funded and it's been started and we should have results of that by October, November. And it is it is expected that the speed limit will drop from 45 to 35. Um, and that's my two main bullets tonight, but uh, that's what we're doing. Are they going to, would they change the speed limit based upon the speed study? Yes, yes. And ba based on, and it's probably going to happen because um, if you don't know the history of this road, um, back when another supervisor, Jerry Highland, was uh, responsible for the Mount Vernon area, BDOT had already done a study, and at that time, this was maybe 20 years ago, it was determined the speed should be dropped to 35. But they did it without telling Jerry or anybody else and just took up the signs. Well, you know what <laughs> happens with that. Uh, the politicians, everybody else uh, said, heck no, and then it went back to 45. This time, they're doing it the right way. Um, they've, they've reached out to the, the political people, and they've also reached out to the citizens, and it, it should happen. It's, it's not a done deal, but it, it, it most likely will happen. Great, thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, Alexis, are you uh, you here? I am. Fantastic. Well, let you Can give me? your report, and then and then Kevin's got to grill you about something. Okay. <laughs> I I was actually I was going to mention the DW Parkway thing as well, even though I know it's in in Pete's uh, purview. But yeah, they'll be speaking at a meeting in May with um, the Fairfax Alliance for Better Bicycling um, to address some of the more specific um, bike and pedestrian access to the trail. Um, these would be the, the parkway. Um, that was the only thing. So what do you got for me, Kevin? Well, you and I, we'd had an exchange of emails and I think with Calvin about uh, uh, Chairman McKay's uh, group on, I can't even remember the name of the group out, but they had left out the transportation components seemed to be left out. And we were, we just had a little back and forth about how to, uh, you know, bring that to his attention and, uh, I don't think it's gone anywhere. So uh, maybe Calvin might want to chime in if he remembers the exchange of emails or, or 
Anybody else has a suggestion? Was I think it, the it, was the, 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 it was the chairman's um, task force on equity, I think. And I they they that, came yeah. out that yeah they they had a, um, a eighteen recommendations that they gave to the board of supervisors, and uh, I don't think there was there wasn't any specific recommendations around transportation. Um, you know, it, it was a group of, of citizens that, that, that he appointed, um, so that, that may have not been their focus. Um, we didn't want to step I'm on not, any I'm toes. Not really, we just yeah, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what the action is or what the recommendation is or what our role should be in this. You know, like it, to me, it, it, it could have been, it could be as simple as just bringing it to the Chairman McKay's uh, transportation staff member, but Calvin, do you recall seeing any of the emails? Did you have any thoughts on it? Uh, yes, I saw the email, but yeah, it was um, it was strange that transportation wasn't mentioned, and, and I had uh, no idea when that uh, work was done, so I I didn't have a have been notice about that. And, yeah, the, the recommendations were sent in February to the chairman. Yeah, again, like, I'm just not sure, you know, if, if we came to the board with a recommendation and it wasn't in someone else's topic area, like, would they come to us and be like, why didn't you talk about my topic? <laughs> so I'm kind of, I think it's important, and I think it's an important aspect of equity, but I'm not sure how to address it vis-a-vis -vis these specific task force recommendations. Calvin, is there any way that you can informally, you know, query as to whether we should just leave it alone or whether we should, we could bring it to somebody's attention? I will talk with Tom and see what he think about it. Yeah. That would be great. That was the, uh, that was all I had for Alexis. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Kevin, uh, uh, Kevin, you can send me that email too, just so I can sort of track what's going on. And, you know, you know, I guess I'm interested to hear what, what Tom has to say. Yeah, uh, please. Thanks. Um, actually, Alexis, I just realized I did have uh, uh, one question uh, for you, the Fairfax lines for uh, better biking. Um, as I mentioned on email there, they reached out and contacted me, but. What I'm thinking is taking advantage of your uh, seat on their board to use you as the primary conduit for them to to work through. It, it seems to make sense. What do you think? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. I'll reply to him. Um, let's see. Since I'm copying you, I can do that. Um, and I'm happy to talk. And 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 you know, if there's something we need to bring to the to the SAC, we can do that. But uh, uh, I spent a while since I hadn't responded yet, so I just want to be able to get back. So appreciate that. Sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. The uh, uh, next is Jeremy. Nothing for me. Thanks. Okay. Um, Eric. I am fine. Thank you. Oh, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Um, and the last person here um, is our illustrious vice chair, Mary uh, <laughs> Pauline. Well, being last, I think we've covered everything. Um, so. Unless someone else has something to add, I will motion to adjourn. I'll second. <laughs> There's been a motion to adjourn and uh, seconded by uh, uh, Roger Huskin. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> I hear the hearing now. We are adjourned. Good night, good night. Good all right. Good night, everyone. Good night. An excellent meeting. Thank you for all. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Yes. Has left the meeting.